Please we go ahead. Greetings and salutations, esteemed guest. I am thrilled to extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us today for this enlightening slide seminar organized by KCIAPM for the June session in association with Sri Shankara Cancer Hospital and Research Center team, Bengaluru. Hi, my name is Nitya Sri, a member of Social Media Subcommittee, KCIAPM, and it is my pleasure to serve you as a for this event. I hope you are all ready to dive into the fascinating event at hand and gain some valuable insights that will help you both personally and professionally. So without further ado, let's get started. As we embark on this journey of knowledge and discovery, I invite you all to sit back, relax and open your mind to the possibilities that await us. I request all of you to please share the YouTube link with your friends and colleagues. Whether you are a seasoned professional or a curious learner, this webinar promises to offer something to everyone. KCIAPM would like to thank Morpho Labs for digitizing the slides for the benefit of all our members. Now, here are a few housekeeping notes for all the audience. Kindly set your YouTube resolution to a minimum of 720 pixels so that you can see our slides clearly. Kindly show your active participation by posting your questions below in the comment section. We will discuss all the questions at the end of each case. And uh, dear contestants and panel of experts, just a gentle reminder to all of you that we are all time bound. Please do have a check on time and uh, do not mind if I have to re remind you amidst uh, ongoing uh, presentation. So now this uh, today's event will be held by the uh, uh, Sri Shankara Cancer Hospital and Research Center team led by Dr. Rekha Vikumar ma'am and Dr. Shanti ma'am. Uh, over to you Dr. Rekha ma'am. Thank you, Nitishri. And good afternoon, everyone. And greetings from Sri Shankar Cancer Hospital and Research I request Center. Rekha, ma'am, to give a few yeah, introductory note to all our contestants. Okay. So, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Aditya and the Karnataka chapter of the IAPM for giving us this opportunity to conduct this slide seminar, interact with all the postgraduates from various medical colleges in our state, and have a very um, interactive discussion with them. Um, so we have 12 cases lined up that will be discussed by six consultants. And uh, I think Nitya, you have already told them the details of how they should present. So we can start right off and Dr. Shanti will kick off with the first case and the first student. Over to Shanti. The first student can share her presentation. Ma'am, uh, good afternoon. Is it visible, ma'am? I can hear you. Yeah, I can see you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, uh, Dr. Shashi Rekha third year postgraduate from Wims Badari. Uh, today I'll be presenting the case of a 52 year old male patient with nasal obstruction. Uh, sign of resolution biopsy was taken. And on microscopy of uh, HND stained slide of this uh, nasal sino nasal lesion showed uh, multiple polypoidal structures uh, which were lined by which are lined by this respiratory epithelium. Subepithelially there is a clear eosinophilic uh, zone Below this uh, clear zone, there is a lesion which is composed of uh, un monotonous, uniform looking uh, blue round cells. These uh, monotonous looking blue round cells had pleomorphic hyperchromatic nucleus with the scan to clear cytoplasm. Uh, few cells uh, also showed, uh, few cells also was showing a fine nucleus with fine appearing chromatin and eosinophilic cytoplasm. Uh, these are the cells which are showing fine, uh, fine appearing chromatin with a prominent nucleus and uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm is seen. Further, these tumor cells are separated by short fibrous stands in between the tumor cells. There are also proliferating thin walled capillaries seen between the tumor cells. And there were also few uh, normal appearing uh, mucosal glands seen in the sections. 
coming to the summary of this case, this is a case of an elderly male who presented with the sinonasal lesion. On microscopy, it showed um, um, polypoidal structures which are lined by uh, stratified related columnar epithelium, uh, which is denuded at few areas. Sub epithelary, there is a clear zone. Below this clear zone, there is a lesion composed of monotonous uniform appearing blue round to oval cells arranged in sheets. These cells have pleomorphic hyperchromatic nucleus with clear cytoplasm. Few cells also show fine appearing chromatin with prominent nucleoli and eosinophilic cytoplasm. In between tumor cells are thin walled capillaries. Few normal appearing mucosal glands are also seen. So based on these features, I would like to give the differential diagnosis as extranodal NK or T cell lymphoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma or primitive neuroectodermal tumor. The features which are favoring to extranodal NK or T cell lymphoma is that it is predominant in males, uh, age group of 50 to 70 years, and it shows sheets, uh, sheets of monotonous uniform round cells. Nucleus is pleomorphic with granular chromatin and nucleoli, but uh, in this case, angioinvasion, angiodestruction, or necrosis is not seen. Um, uh, features which are favoring uh, rhabdomyosarcoma are it is a most common sinonasal sarcoma, but it is seen in children or young adults. And it shows sheets of monotonous uniform round cells, nucleus having pleomorphic hypochromatic nucleus, and uh, cytoplasm is scanned to clear. Features which are favoring Ewing sarcoma or primitive neuroectodermal tumor is that it is commonly seen in male, uh, but it is predominantly seen in children and young adults. It, it also shows sheets of monotonous uniform round cells, uh, nucleus which is pleomorphic, having fine uh, appearing chromatin and nucleoli. Cytoplasm is scanned to clear. It shows prominent thin walled vessels, but we are uh, we are not able to see the pseudo, pseudo uh, rosettes in this slide. Uh, I would further like to confirm my diagnosis by doing IHC marker study, uh, that is myogenin, myodi or desmin for rhabdomyosarcoma. CD9, NKX 2.2 for Ewing sarcoma or primitive neuroectodermal tumor. CD, uh, CD3, CD5 for T cell lymphoma. TIA1, granzyme B, perforins. Uh, these are cytotoxic markers which are uh, expressed for both uh, NK or T cell lymphoma and CD56 for NK cell lineage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shashirika. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I will share my screen. I think you can stop sharing. Thank you. Can you share my see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you have covered all the points. Most of them, or maybe a couple of points, I would uh, like you to focus on also. So first thing is, uh, uh, you had mentioned extra no, NK bar T cell lymphoma. Uh, you mentioned the important points also, but I would say. So don't straight away start as T cell lymphoma. It would be preferable you call it lymphoma first and then go for the subtype because it's not that we get only T lymphomas there, right? Yeah. So, uh, you have, uh, as she has already described, we have a 52 year old male with a polypoidal lesion in the uh, sinonasal area. So, uh, I will skip the morphology part. Uh, she has covered all the points. There were not much of uh, hypochromatic or pleomorphic. Uh, the amount of pleomorphism was, uh, we'd say, moderate. And the cells are predominantly medium-sized in this uh, case. So these were the responses that we got from uh, all of you. And the predominant, uh, the most common, uh, the response was about either a lymphoma or an olfactory neuroblastoma. And uh, the all the other DDs I have uh, that the responses were given, I have mentioned in this list. So let's see what this case actually turned out to be. So I would uh, always uh, uh, prefer that we also mention the negative points. We have men uh, Dr. Shashi Rekha had mentioned in the differentials about what was not seen. So in a small round cell tumor, the importance uh, lies in that we look for subtle features in the histopathology. There are multiple reasons for this. Main is that we have a long list of differentials and we can't do immunohistochemistry for all of them. And many of the settings uh, may not have the immunohistochemistry set up or they may not have all the immunohistochemistry markers. And there can be financial reasons. You may have to be limited with your number of markers that you do. So it's better that we, uh, it is important that we actually reduce the uh, differentials, narrow down the differentials. For that, let's look at what all features we have to look for in the microscopy. So look for rosettes, tubules, alveolar patterns, and look for anaplasia, rhabdoid cells, 
the chromatin in this case was more of vesicular to homogeneous with an occasional uh, distinct nucleolus. There was no prominent eosinophilic macronucleoli. There was no stipple chromatin of a neuroendocrine tumor. And there were no heterologous elements. Dr. Shashi Rekha, could you tell any one differential why I'm saying no heterologous elements? Any other DDs in the sinonasal region? Okay. Dr. Shashrika? Okay, uh, you can come back with the answer. Maybe you can put it in the chat box. And uh, there were no bacilloid features. So we have a long list. Uh, all these differentials, I think uh, lymphoma and uh, rhabdomyosarcoma and one more you had mentioned, right? Um, yeah. Yes. So, Ewing yeah, sarcoma. What was it that? Ewing sarcoma, yeah. So the other differentials would be melanoma, sinonasal and differential carcinoma, nut carcinoma, teratocarcinosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma and uh, neuroendocrine tumors and rhabdomyosarcoma. So uh, there are other tumors which can come in the same region, but which do not have a classic small round cell morphology, such as a biphasic synovial sarcoma, glomangiopericytoma, and other tumors such as meningiomas, amyloblastoma, and craniopharyngioma, and of course lymphomas. I have only mentioned the common one. So it's we should always go with the basic uh, lineage markers, that is pan cytokeratin CD45, S100, and Vimentin. So if you're Pan CK comes positive. The next set of markers that you can do are P40, P63, synaptophysin, chromogranin, and P60. And if available, an ad carcinoma if there is a suspicion. And CD45, if it comes positive, it helps us to go further on the hematolymphoid uh, lineage lines. So we will decide the markers based on that. And if S100 alone came positive without a pan CK, you would think of a melanoma and so do the uh, melanoma markers. And if Vimentin had come positive, uh, the possibility of Ewing's and for with CD99 and NKX2.2 or Desmin and MyoD1 for a rhabdomyosarcoma. So let's see what happened in this case. So this is CD45. So I think we have narrowed down a lot. The differentials has come to the hematolymphoid line. And in the hematolymphoid malignancy, always it is imperative you do uh, both a precursor marker and a mature lymphoma marker. So this was a myeloperoxidase. As you can see, there is a strong cytoplasmic positivity in many of the cells. This is TDT, and that is showing a nuclear positivity, moderate to strong in many of the cells. And this is KI67. It is not. It is uh, around uh, around 60 percent or 60 to 70 percent or so. So I think now we have a diagnosis with this IHC. Dr. Shashrika, would you like to say? You can be online so that I can you can answer my questions. So that it's very interactive. Would you like to narrow down to one now? Ma'am, it's most probably hematolymphoid, ma'am. Uh, yes. uh, lymphoid, ma'am. CD45. Okay. 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 So in that, it is specifically myeloid sarcoma because we are getting the, yeah, we are getting the markers which are typically fitting for this. So it's by definition, myeloid sarcoma is an extramedullary tumor mass that effaces the tissue architecture and is composed of myeloid blasts with or without maturation. So this is the WHO definition. That uh, myeloid sarcomas can occur in many sites, and as listed here, it can occur concurrently or as a relapse of AML, and can be even a transformation of a pre-existing myeloproliferative neoplasm or an MDS. You can do cytochemical stains on touch preparations. More commonly, we do IHCs and then we do also follow up with, compare it with the hematological, the peripheral blood, bone marrow, and flow cytometry. And if available, the other uh, higher studies, cytogenetics and molecular analysis. So this is open quiz. And um, this is for all the participants or all the audience. Uh, you mm -hmm. can put it there, your answers in the chat box. So myeloid sarcoma was, uh, is not, was also called as DASH uh, due to its green color and gross appearance. And what is the color due to? What, is, what does it contain that is giving the green color? I will come back to the answer at the end of this case. So the differentials that uh, I have received as responses. So this was the extranodal NK T cell lymphoma, which uh, many people, many of the uh, pathologists have given. Uh, so as you can see, this is the typical angiocentric uh, uh, tumor. And this is the large areas of necrosis. Then olfactory neuroblastoma, uh, 
you have a grading system for olfactory neuroblastoma. Can anyone reply in the chat box what is the grading system called as? So this is a maybe a grade one tumor which has typical neuropil, neurofibrillary background and rosette formation. The flexner winterstein are rosettes which we can see classically in this picture. This is a higher grade tumor, a grade three bar four tumor which has large areas of necrosis and a high grade appearance of the nuclei. Though a vague rosettoid pattern can be seen in some places. Now, uh, I had a differential response as alveolar RMS. So, it, this is a picture of alveolar RMS where you have the typical alveolar patterns. You have the fibrous septae forming alveoli. And uh, in an RMS, we try to look for the rhabdomyoblast. You have as uh, uh, rhabdomyoblast, as you know, the typical uh, appearance of a very eosinophilic granular cytoplasm and uh, distinct nucleoli. The other DDs, malignant melanoma, is usually is uh, the great masquerader. So always keep it in the differential, especially if it is an amelanotic case, you may always miss it. So keep it in the differential. Sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma is a poorly differentiated carcinoma, basically. And you may have a distinct nucleoli in that also. And the immunohistochemistry can help you with the uh, for the, uh, the for the differentiation. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma is again a carcinoma with a squamous differentiation, which may show the squamous uh, morphology or not, or prove it by IHC. Uh, but the location for the nasopharyngeal, this is a sinonasal carcinoma, uh, location of this case. And last, Ewing sarcoma. Here we see that monotonous population in sheets uh, and a vague rosetoid pattern can occur. Again, confirmed. As you have mentioned, as Dr. Shashirik has mentioned, the uh, how to come to a conclusion for Ewing's. So the highlight of this case is that we have to come to a morphological differential diagnosis. May, may not be one. We can have a few possibilities. This will help us to limit the number of immunohistochemistry markers that we do. And always go in a step-by-step -step approach. An algorithmic approach is important. And again, we have to have a thorough knowledge of the differentials. Is there any question, Dr. Shashireka? Would you like, is there um, anything you would like to comment in your case? No. Okay, okay, fine. I think we can go on to the second case. I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, case number two, the presenter can join. Can you hear me? Is it visible, ma'am? I can screen. Uh, see your screen. Uh, yes. Can you hear me, ma'am? Sorry, I think Dr. Nitishri will answer. Uh, I can see yours. Ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please start. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Yamuna Bhave, a second year postgraduate from uh, Kidbai Memorial Institute of Oncology. Uh, and the case two has been allotted for us. The history given is as follows 63 year old male patient with uh, right nasopharyngeal mass. So, this is the full mount view showing a single polypoidal uh, fragment of tissue. As we move on to the scanner view, we can see the lining stratified squamous epithelium which is denuded at a uh, few places. As we move on to the LOPA view, we can see the lining stratified squamous epithelium with, with the subepithelium showing uh, a neoplasm arranged in sheets, composed of a normal appearing yeah, plasma cells. Okay, yeah, ma yes, ma'am. Uh, which are uh, predominantly medium sized with uh, uh, abundant basophilic cytoplasm, uh, eccentrically placed nucleus with a perinuclear half and inconspicuous nucleoli and the mitosis uh, is uh, ours. Also noted some uh, scattered uh, atypical uh, plasma cells which are having a high NC ratio and dispersed chromatin as we can see here. Then a few binucleate forms are also noted 
and few uh, pleomorphic plasma cells noted pleomorphic cells noted in the form of multinucleate cells and polylobated forms also <coughs> and uh, the also seen are some uh, plasma cells with uh, intracytoplasmic inclusions in the form of resil bodies and mod cells also and a few hyalinized blood vessels noted uh, surround, uh, which is surrounded by the plasma cells and uh, homogeneous eosinophilic deposits were also noted at a uh, few foci. Uh, to summarize, mainly sheets of predominantly normal appearing plasma cells with scattered immature by atypical plasma cells with the multinucleation and polylobation and presence of resil bodies and mod cells were noted. So I would like, uh, like to give the diagnosis of plasma cell neoplasm of the nasopharynx. If, the, if this lesion is solitary, uh, the possibility of extramedullary plasma cytoma can be considered. If it's a part of systemic disease, then uh, uh, we can think of the diagnosis of extraosseous plasma cytoma in uh, multiple myeloma. However, before coming to the diagnosis, I want to know the clinical history and the radiological findings to know any other uh, osteolytic lesions and serological findings like uh, serum calcium, uh, serum uh, creatinine and uh, hemoglobin levels. And uh, I would like to confirm the diagnosis with the uh, IHC, with the positive markers being CD38, CD138, MUM1, and the negative markers of uh, CD45, CD20, and PAX5. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yamuna. Um, My screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you have covered all the points. Uh, of course, it, it's a plasma cell lesion at this point, I will tell you. I will show you the IHCs and then you can tell me. Since you have mentioned the IHC markers, what you would need, uh, I can show you those and please tell me what you would think of this case. So, um, it's a polypoidal mass and yeah, uh, I will come to the uh, predominantly a plasma cell, uh, a lesion which is composed of plasma cells and cells with a plasma cytoid morphology. And of, as she showed, there were a few uh, cells which were looking moderate to markedly pleomorphic and with also the presence of the uh, resil and the mod bodies. So the responses that I've got for this case are, uh, most of you have given the uh, diagnosis of plasma cytoma and a few others that have got pituitary tumor olfactory neuroblastoma, maltoma, plasma blastic lymphoma, and neuroendocrine tumor. These were a few responses that I've got. So let's see uh, when we have a plasma cell rich lesion. So let's consider what are all the differentials, both a benign as or a non neoplastic as well as a neoplastic. Let's not just keep only neoplastic differentials. So uh, of course, plasma cytoma, myeloma, and there is always the lymphomas which will show plasma cytic, extensive plasma cytoid differentiations. Uh, some of these, as I have listed here, and the non neoplastic related diseases, IgG4 and Castleman disease. So, uh, as you wanted, uh, uh, as we would always do for a plasma cell rich lesion, CD138, kappa, and lambda. So, would you agree that it is a monoclonal population now? Kappa positive? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So at this point, uh, let's see what are all the uh, other features as you asked, the clinical features. So first thing is that it is in the nasopharyngeal location. Of course, the extramedullary, uh, the plasma, extra osseous plasma cytoma, one of the commonest, commonest location is in this region, the head and neck region. But still, we know that the uh, lymphoid uh, tissue is also there, the Waldeyer's ring and, uh, you know, the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue is there. So let's see what the other uh, markers came. Of course, I have not uh, shown you, you were asked for PAX5, but I have not shown you that. But these are the markers that uh, have come diffusely and strongly positive. CD45, CD79A, CD20, and BCL2. 
So if it was only a plasma cytoma, we expect a positive CD138, CD38, CD56, and negative for CD45 and BCL2. But one would always argue that an aberrant expression in IHC is always common, uh, is always possible. So uh, it is known that CD20, CKIT, CD33, and CD10 can be aberrantly expressed in a plasma cytoma. But if we get such a strong CD45 and BCL2 and uh, in such a location, it is very unlikely to be a entirely a plasma cytoma. And uh, when you have sample for flow cytometry, it may not be that you, you, you may not have it all the time, but if you have a sample, that would be definitely helpful. A negative CD99, a dim CD45, and a positive CD56. So we'll see what were the biochemical and clinical findings for this patient. So immunoglobulin, uh, IgG was increased, but not to the cutoff uh, required. IgM and IgA were normal. Serum calcium was normal. Creatinine was normal. Kappa was increased when compared to lambda, but kappa-lambda ratio was normal. And M-band was present, but it was not a significant level. And his uh, CBC was normal. Coming to the PET scan, the radiology, now we always get PET scans uh, uh, more than uh, X-rays. Uh, so it is also helpful to see what are all the other areas involved. So this patient had a two centimeter lesion in the parapharyngeal space with SUV of 27 and cervical lymph nodes, external obturator, inguinal nodes, and bulky tonsils. He didn't have any bone lesions. So the PET scan report was uh, considering a possibility of lymphoma. So in this case, we are correlating the morphology, IHC, or positivity for CD45, BCL2, CD20, biochemical and radiological findings of a parapharyngeal mass with lymph nodes. The diagnosis of an extranodal marginal zone lymphoma is considered. So uh, just a few points in this case. It's uh, the essential and desirable criteria for a marginal zone lymphoma, a lymph lymphoma arising the extranodal site. Atypical small medium sized lymphoid population mimicking the reactive malt and showing architectural distortion, expression of B lineage markers, and exclusion of other B cell neoplasms. I have not shown the IHCs in this case, but all of them were negative. Uh, we have excluded the other possibilities follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, SLL, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, and plasma cytoma. And the desirable criteria being demonstration of light chain restriction or clonal immunoglobulin gene rearrangement, lymphoepithelial lesions, and remnants of underlying inflammatory background. So I will just show a couple of pictures for the other differentials which were considered. Pituitary tumor was one differential. However, we know that pituitary tumor it occurs in the cellar and supracellar locations. Uh, ectopic locations have been described, but it is unlikely in such a clinical scenario. Uh, presence of a parapharyngeal mass with extensive lymphadenopathy. Um, and plasma plastic lymphoma was also given as a DD, but the plasma cytic is different from plasma blastic, as we can obviously make out the blastic appearance of the cells with typical uh, prominent eosinophilic nucleoli. So this uh, cannot be a differential in this case. So I would like to conclude this case by saying that plasma cells can occur in many locations and many conditions. Now, in this case, I, we didn't discuss about the Castleman and the IgG4. We had done a Congo red stain. It was negative for those pink, uh, you had uh, pink uh, areas, like uh, which was highlighted by the presenter. So all those were um, the uh, Congo red was negative, and we have also shown a clonal population. So the possibility of Castleman disease is also unlikely. So in any plasma cell uh, lesion, clinical correlation is absolutely required. So thank you, Dr. Um, Yamuna. I will just quickly answer for the quiz question. Yeah, many of you have answered that chloroma and the answer was chloroma and myeloperoxidase. Thank you. We will now go on to case number three. I will hand over to Dr. Rika. Case number three, Dr. Kirti. Yeah, Are you sharing? Uh, yeah. Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. Myself, uh, Dr. Kirti, postgraduate from Enapoya Medical College. So today I'm going to discuss about the case number three. So the clinical history which was provided was a 61 year old female. She had underwent a left upper lobectomy. Moving on to the microscopy. As we see in the scanner, there is a well circumscribed lesion uh, in the both images, and we are able to see within the lesion there are some hemorrhagic areas and there are some 
vascular spaces and surrounding the lesion there are adjacent bronchioles that we see and the lung tissue is also seen. So next moving on to the lower power view. So here we are able to see there are many vascular spaces and few of the vessels showing the hyalinized uh, vessel wall as you see here. So next in some other areas, there are cells like a uh, bland looking tumor cells where you can see in the left side, there are some air, tra air spaces trapped within the tumor. And in the right side, we can see there are some uh, hemocytin laden macrophages along with the blood flakes. So next, moving on to the higher power, as we see here, there are tumor cells arranged in some clusters where we are able to appreciate two cell population that is mainly the yellow arrow indicates you the surface cells that has a eosinophilic cytoplasm with a round oval nuclei. And the red arrow indicates you the polygonal cells that is the stromal cells with the regular nuclei with a, some area showing the prominent nucleoli. And in the right side, we can see the yellow arrow indicates some kind of hobnail pattern and the red arrow shows you the multinucleated tumor giant cells where it is condensed to form a giant cells. And the green arrow shows you there are few areas showing the system macrophages too. So next in this field of view, we can see there is an extensively sclerosed area. And here on the right side, we can see there is a chunk of tumor where the surface cells that is preserved and the inner stromal cells, which is replaced by the hyalinization. It is totally sclerosed in many areas as we see here. So with this, uh, in the higher power view, there is another area like where we can see the intranuclear inclusion, which is less, and there are mitosis very sparse with some area showing hyperchromatic nuclei also. So with this like uh, dual cell population with the uh, pneumocytic kind of uh, epithelium and the stromal, like a polygonal kind of cells. And also uh, we have seen extensive sclerose area as we have seen here. And with the dilated vessels, I would like to consider the possible diagnosis as a sclerosing pneumocytoma, which comes under the uh, WHO classification of tumors of lung under the epithelial adenoma. So it is also previously known as sclerosing hemangioma because it was thought to be that it arises from the vascular origin. But after the IHC has been evolved, what happened? They proved that it is not a vascular origin. There is an epithelial origin. So that like a kind of a type 2 pneumocyte. So the name was renamed as a sclerosing pneumocytoma. So, and I would also consider the differential diagnosis of two. One is epithelial hemangioendothelioma and the other is solitary fibrous tumor. Why? Because uh, there are aspases which resembling like a vascular spaces and there are some tumor cells that is plumb like endothelial kind of cells which I see in few areas. And why solitary fibrous tumor? Because there are few areas in the periphery which looks like a stack on type of pattern, the vessels and also some spindle cells arranged haphazardly. So to confirm the diagnosis, I'd like to do certain IHC panel like for sclerosing pneumocytoma or hemangioma, the surface cells and the stromal cells will be positive for CK, EME, TTF1 and CAM 5.2, whereas the surface cells will be positive for napsin A and stromal cells will be negative for napsin A. And the stromal cells also shows a positive for ER and PR that shows the higher predominance in the females, which has an indirect role. And the vascular markers also we can do. And uh, for SFT, the standard one is chat 6 we, we, we can do that for the eye confirmation. So if feasible, we can also do the molecular test for the uh, confirmation sake. Uh, like for a sclerosing pneumocytoma, AKT1 and BRAF PV600E, which is rarely mutated. And for uh, epithelial hemangioendothelioma, WWTR1 and CAMTA1. And for SFT standard is STAT6. So would like to know more about the radiological investigation and IHC for the further confirmation. So I have attached also an article which is regarding the sclerosing hemangioma. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the case. Thank you. Great, Taman. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kirti. You've thank done you. an excellent, brilliant presentation, I would say. And uh, excellent indeed. So I will just start sharing my slides. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you wanted radiology, right? And a little bit of uh, the, the symptoms. She only okay. had persistent cough for seven months. There was no other significant history. There was no weight loss. There was nothing else. And uh, CT X-ray and uh, thorax revealed yes. a small lesion. It was 1.5 by 1.5 centimeter. Bronchoscopy, pulmonary function tests were normal. Now, FNA, which was done in an outside center, was suggestive of neuroendocrine carcinoma uh, or a neuroendocrine neoplasm. And so the lobectomy had been done in our center. And I don't have the gross picture, but uh, it was a well-circumscribed mass. 
and it was away from the pleura and the entire tumor was grossed in three blocks. And you've already shown this. So you this is the whole mound section. And this is what you saw. And yes. I think you have described it so well. I'm going to actually skip all that, except to say that there were four patterns which you described very well. So well circumscribed margin and the sclerotic area, a solid looking area, a hemorrhagic area, and the papillae. I think we have taken pictures of the same area, the sclerotic papillae, right? And again, you have already highlighted the two kinds of cells, the surface cells and the stromal cells. And again, I have done the same thing to show you the surface cells and the stromal cells which have been described. Uh, one thing which was a little unusual in our case was that we also had these areas. Within the stromal cells, the surface cells also were columnar. They, they showed mucus and some of them were ciliated. Otherwise, I think you, you had taken pictures of every kind of uh, thing. So, basically, four patterns, two types of cells. No atypia, mitotic activity. Now, the differential diagnosis, uh, what is in red is what I received from the respondents. But I will start with what I did. So it, it had been called carcinoid tumor. Now, can we think of any kind of adenoma as described? Can it be a low-grade carcinoma? And of course, we get solitary mets. So we, in the lung, we can never forget that a metastasis can present like that. These are the other differentials that I received uh, from the respondents. And I think salivary gland type tumor was a very good differential. Epithelial, myoepithelial, carcinoma, and mucoepidermoid. Because these have distinctive two types of cells. Epithelial, myoepithelial. And mucoepidermoid carcinoma has three kinds of cells. So if you look at the variety of cell types, this was a good differential. Except that these are usually endobronchial. Now, the majority had called this picoma, perivascular epithelioid cell tumor, and epithelioid hemangioendothelioma or epithelioid hemangioma. And quite a few had called it pulmonary hematoma. So I'm just going to show pictures of what it is not since uh, Kirti has done such a good job. So this is how picoma will look. So one will find sheets of cells with very clear cell margins, clear cytoplasm, and this very... Um, prominent kind of vascular uh, vascular septae and minimal atypia. So we didn't, and this is the only uh, feature really throughout the tumor. Ours was very different from this. Now, if you consider epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, it can be circumscribed, centrally sclerotic, and a little peripheral. Uh, peripherally, it, it's more invasive. And you can have papillae. I think these sclerotic papillae, which can be seen in epithelioid hemangioendothelioma with overlying epithelium can be mistaken. But if you look in other areas, there's a very characteristic mixohyaline matrix in which you find the epithelioid cells are embedded. And these cells, one will look for the intracytoplasmic luminae, which may contain RBCs or not. So if you look at the entire histology, uh, it is not that which, which is seen in our tumor. The other DD that was given was pulmonary hamartoma. So I think the, the mixture of cell types is what gave rise to some students thinking this. But, <clears throat> but a hematoma is marked by, you must have at least two mesenchymal components. And the red arrow shows you the area where the invaginated bronchial epithelium is. It is an entrapped epithelium. And you, it's most often chondroid. The mesenchymal component is highline cartilage, which you can see with the blue arrow. Another blue arrow points to the adipose tissue, the two mesenchymal elements that are most common. So this also has a very characteristic appearance. If you see this tumor, you really won't think of anything else except maybe a pulmonary chondroma. So it does not actually uh, come in the differential diagnosis of what this tumor is. And um, yeah, these were the others. Myoepithelial, uh, epithelial, myoepithelial can have this kind of look which may resemble uh, uh, what this tumor is with well circumscribed margins. Mucoepidermoid, again, because you can have mucus secreting cells, intermediate cells, epidermoid cells. So it can look kind of very complex like how our cases. Now, um, 
Kirti, you yes. have to tell me. You have described it so beautifully. Tell me what you're seeing in the IHCs, in our case. CK is positive for uh, the surface epithelial cells. And negative? The negative for uh, the stroma no, cell. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ima? Ima is positive cytoplasm. Membrane positive membrane is in the stromal cells and also in the epithelial cells. Epithelial cells. And vimentin also. Vimentin is diffusely positive in the uh, round cells and in the cuboidal cells, the surface cells. cells. Okay. Yeah. So this is just the whole mount section of epithelial membrane antigen. Just to show you that it was diffusely positive, vimentin was also positive in both components. The entire tumor was positive. Now, for those who thought of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, this is CD34. So it's just decorating the vascular channels and yes. not the surface cells or cuboidal cells. And uh, Kirti, KI? It's low, ma'am. Okay, it's very seven. low. It's very yeah. low. So, and importantly, it was not a carcinoid. Uh, more, yeah, synaptochromogranin. And P40, for those who might have thought it is a leukoepidermoid carcinoma, P40 was negative. Okay, you describe the TTF1 pattern for me. TTF1, the cuboidal epithelial cell, the surface epithelial cells shows a mild positivity. And here? Stromal cells showing mild. It's now? very focally, focally showing positivity. No, no, it is positive. If you look okay. at the cuboidal cells here and here, yeah, yes, both are positive. Similar in yeah. some area. Some areas, it's more dark. Yes. Okay, but both are positive. positive. This is really the clinching thing, right? Yeah. So you were right, sclerosing pneumocytoma. And what was a little distinctive in this particular tumor is that we also found tall columnar cells, mm -hmm. which were goblet-like and ciliated, which were part of the tumor and not entrapped bronchioles. So just very basically, so there are six types of adenomas of the lung. And in the latest WHO, there is one included. And as you mentioned, sclerosing pneumocytoma used to be called sclerosing hemangioma, but no longer because we know it is a neoplasm which derives from the primitive respiratory epithelium, which is why both the components are positive for TTF1. AKT1 alterations have been found in nearly all of them. So essential is that you find the two cell types, the surface cells and the round cells, and the four patterns. Desirable is IHC. So I think what we're trying to say is that you can make this diagnosis on morphology. And IHC is desirable if you have any doubt. So the TTF1 and EMA being positive in both types of cells, CK being positive only in the surface cells, but absent or weak in the round cells. Striking a female preponderance, like in our patient, it's common in Asians. So I think in India, we can expect to see at least one or two in, you know, in your practice. Uh, what is important to know is though it is clubbed as a benign tumor, slash zero in the ICD-DO coding, in less than 2% of cases, this can behave as a malignant tumor. And one very important thing is it's difficult to make an accurate diagnosis when you have a needle core biopsy. If somebody does a needle core biopsy or an FNA, as in our case, it was wrongly thought of as a carcinoid tumor elsewhere, or if somebody sends it to you for a frozen section, it's going to be very difficult in the absence of clinical and radiological information. But in a surgical resection, one should be able to make the diagnosis on morphology alone. I've just list of uh, cases. Uh, so less than 2% have shown malignant features. So for all purposes, it's a benign tumor. So my take home message is, again, read your books, look at the pictures, uh, make use of whatever literature is available, be aware of this. Because if you're aware of this, the moment you see the slide, you're going to think of this entity. So thank you, Kirti. Very good job done. Thank you. Thank you, Rekhaman. That was a, a nice presentation with a clear and concise manner. Now I would like to invite our fourth contestant, Dr. Sonali. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. I'll Please introduce yourself. 
myself dr sonali second year post graduate from department of pathology cvm patel medical college bijapur i'll be presenting the case number 4 Proceed, proceed. Just the case, yeah, the case four was of a 75 year old lady, little core biopsy of lesion in the right pleural cavity. This is the full mount view showing three little core biopsies. Two bits of the little core biopsy shows tumor cells arranged in clusters, seeds, pods, and singly scattered. Higher magnification showed round to poly, round to oval. Around the polygonal tumor cells having hypochromatic pleomorphic nuclei with irregular nuclear borders. The cytoplasm is moderate in amount and was clear to use. There were also few bizarre cells, large pleomorphic cells, and atypical mitotic figures noted. This is the picture showing few atypical mitotic figures and a few bizarre cells. Also noted foci of skeletal muscle bundles amidst the at foci, fragment of columnar cells, which are arranged in picket fence pattern and honeycomb pattern were seen. Nuclei of these cells are very round to oval, so in order to anisonucleosis and few showing nuclear pleomorphism also. The cell of origin may be mesothelial cells or fragments of metastatic tumor cells. So my impression was the little core biopsy is positive for malignancy and features are of adenocarcinoma, metastasis or infiltration from primary lung adenocarcinoma, probably invasion, invasive non mucinous solid variant of grade 3 adenocarcinoma. And my differential diagnosis were metastatic renal cell carcinoma and clear cell variant of epithelial mesothelioma. So, points in favor of adenocarcinoma lung were nests and sheets of large round cells to polygonal cells, moderate amount of eosinophilic to clear cytoplasm. Few columnar cells were arranged in picket fence in honeycomb pattern showing nuclear pleomorphism and irregularity. The points in favor of clear cell RCC were the tumor cells with clear cytoplasm, but there was absence of nested tubular or alveolar growth pattern and absence of complex vascular network of capillaries surrounding every nest of the tumor cells. The points in favor of clear cell variant of epithelial mesothelioma were presence of mesothelial cell clusters showing atypia, and the points against were absence of tubular papillary pattern and spindle cells. For further confirmation, I need to do the IHC. So, for adenocarcinoma lung, TTF1 and NAPSIN will give positivity. For clear cell RCC, carbonic anhydrase 9, vimentin, and MFR will show positivity. And for clear cell variant of mesothelioma, their calatinin, CK56, and D240 will give positivity. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sonali. So, um, you presented it well, so I'm not going to show these pictures. I think you presented everything. Uh, one thing I wanted to say was for those students who have not seen cross striations, in this digitized image, there were very nice cross striations of the skeletal muscle bundles because the tumor cells were going in between the muscle bundles. So, mm -hmm. I, I just thought I'd point that out. But otherwise, very well described. You had these large cells, clear cytoplasm, some looking bizarre, mm -hmm. some not so bizarre. Okay, so um, uh, I think Sonali has presented a lot about metastasis from other sites, which really one would think about. And this was the, the most number of responses were from this, uh, were, were this saying metastasis uh, from some other site, unknown, breast, lung, kidney and melanoma. Uh, there were quite a few respondents who, who wrote back solitary fibrous tumor, clear cell type. And I think that there's a recent report in 2023 
in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology that describes 13 cases of clear cell type of solitary fibrous tumor. But this is very, very rare, just to be aware of that. Of course, mesothelioma, you can have a clear cell type, desmoplastic, sarcomatoid. These were the responses. Uh, picoma lung, certainly, can be considered in this case. Primary clear cell sarcoma of soft tissue arising in pleura, again, very rare. And one should also think of any other tumor that can show clear cell morphology. So these are all the responses, plus a few which I put together. Now, um, Sonali, yes. uh, you spoke about metastasis. Uh, but I can tell you it was negative for pancytokeratin, CK7, and CK20. Okay. So would you continue with that? Uh, and, uh... It can be a primary tumor in the lung that would have infiltrated the pleura. Okay. Like but, carcinoma. So, but that would be uh, cytokeratin and CK7 positive, isn't it? Uh, Non-invasive -inv uh, mucinous will be CK7 positive. But pancytokeratin should be positive in any carcinoma unless it's anaplastic. So, shall we go on to some more uh, markers? Or can yes. you think of anything else? Because cytokeratin is positive in carcinoma and mesothelioma. Right? Mesothelioma, yes. Right. So, okay. So, I'm going to tell you all the other markers that we did. So, it was negative for all these markers. S100, leukocyte common antigen. So I want you to just think why it was done. CD30, WT1 and calretinin, these are mesothelial markers. Pax8 and ER, TTF1, HMB45, SOX10, Melin A, Desmin, Caldesmon, Smooth Muscle Actin, CD34, SAL4, and TFE3. Now this sounds like we have a lot of money or the patient has a lot of money. But there's a reason why we did this, and I'll tell you in the next slide. But can you tell me um, what next? If you can't, I'll go on. So, okay, I'm going to the next slide. So what marker have we not done? To recap, she's a 75-year-old woman. We got this biopsy from a neighboring hospital. There was no history other than lesion and pleural cavity. And the consultant was not available on the phone. And we have to keep to tat and the clock starts ticking, which is why we went on with the immunohistochemistry. All we know is it's a clear cell malignant neoplasm. So Sonali, anything else you want to do that we have not done? We have no clinical history at all. We have no radiology. Okay, I'm going to go on because we don't have time. This is a marker we did next. And you can see this diffuse membranous staining of all the neoplastic cells. And you see skeletal muscle bundles in between. Can you guess what this marker is? Dr. Shanti has spoken about this a lot. That's a big hint. Think of the previous case, the second one of Dr. Shanti's case two. Anyone else in the chat box? What marker is this? Carbonic anhydrase 9 will show strong membranous positivity. Yeah, but uh, this was not that. Okay, I'm going to tell you. This was CD138. Okay. So what is specific about CD138? It is sensitive and specific for plasma cells and plasma cell differentiation, but only within hematolymphoid tissues, right? In benign and malignant conditions. So we know CD138 can also be positive in a lot of carcinomas, breast, lung, endometrium, whole lot. It's positive in many sarcomas too. Synovial sarcoma and GIST, uh, alveolar soft part sarcoma. It's also positive in melanoma. So CD138 is specific for plasma cells only 
uh, when we think of hematolymphoid tissue, so, uh, okay, we think, could these be plasma cells? But we can't be sure because we know it can be positive in many other conditions. So, we did another stain. Can you tell me what this is? This is a nuclear stain. Nuclear positivity. Yeah. So, now you saw CD138. Can you think of any other marker which can show nuclear staining, which is also CD138 positive? Remember all the negative markers. This is like an IC quiz. I'm going to tell you, it's MUM1. So MUM1 is positive in B cells and cells showing plasma cell differentiation, but it can also be positive in melanoma. So the good thing about MUM1 is it is, as far as we know, it is negative in epithelial tumors. But the problem with IHC markers is the more you do them, the more you're going to find them positive in things that you never ever thought of. But as of now, it is not positive in epithelial tumors. So now, can you tell me what we're thinking of now? So now you think of plasma cell, uh, plasma yeah. cell Yes, it's a plasma cell neoplasm. So how do we uh, uh, confirm this? We do IHC for lambda and kappa, and luckily it was very good. There was no non-specific staining. There was light chain restriction with lambda being positive and kappa being negative. So we suggested a workup for multiple myeloma, but the patient unfortunately succumbed uh, before any test could be done. This we found out later, and uh, we could get this image later, which showed that this was in the pleural cavity, but it also involved the ribs and, uh, and the joints with infiltration of the neural foramina. It was a low uptake uh, lesion on PET scan. So uh, finally, we have a clear to vacuolated cytoplasm uh, tumor, centrally placed nuclei. There was no perinuclear HOF. Mm -hmm. So what was causing this clear clarity in the cytoplasm? So earlier they thought it was artifactual, pertaining to decal on bone marrow. But this specimen that we got did not undergo decalcification. It was a soft tissue bit. And other authors, Sweck et al., they have hypothesized that it's because of misfolded proteins and formation of autophagic vacuoles. So it is not due to glycogen or fat, but it is due to one of these two conditions. So I think the take-home message is always obtain clin relevant clinical and radiological information because we, we couldn't do that. But one must make the utmost effort always just to save on a lot of unnecessary IHC. Also remember that clear cell is a cytologic feature. It is not a histological subtype. Like we say clear cell RCC, but that is an aberration. In most other cases, clear cell just shows it's a clear cell something else. And keep this entity of a clear cell plasma cell neoplasm when you have even a biopsy from soft tissue. And include light chain restriction when you find CD138 or MUM1 uh, positivity because we know they are not 100% specific. And even IHC light chain restriction may not be clear. And then one will have to do in situ hybridization for the mRNA. Now, I'd like to acknowledge our former fellow, Dr. Sudipta Naskar, who took the pictures. And this uh, case report has been accepted in the Indian Journal of Medical and Pediatric Oncology. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, really have to appreciate the effort it has been put into preparing such a comprehensive and insightful presentation. Now. Thank you so much. You. I would like to invite uh, case number five, Dr. Smitha. Yes, ma'am. I'm sharing my presentation. Yeah, please share your screen. Start presenting. Um, can you see my presentation? Are you sharing? Dr. Smitha, I am presenting case number five. I, I represent Mysore Medical College and Research Center. So, um, so this, my case is of a 65-year-old female with abdominal pain. The CT abdomen shows a 10 by 6 centimeter lesion in the body of the pancreas. The specimen sent was the resection specimen of the pancreas. So this is a low power view. A 10x view showing the pancreatic SNI and the stromal tissue. And you can see intervening posicellular fibrocollagenous tissue comprising the stroma. This is a high power view which shows the pancreatic SNI arranged in lobules. 
and can also appreciate multinucleated giant cells in a second hyperview. You can also see few atypical mitotic figures and few bizarre cells noted at hyperview. So the microscopic uh, findings. Dr. Smitha? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is not in the PowerPoint mode. Can you put it to the PowerPoint presentation full screen? Yes, full screen. So the microscopic uh, okay. microscopy says the uh, sections studied from the pancreatic tissues are highly cellular, showing uh, pancreatic acyanide arranged in lobules with mononuclear tumor cells. Few of these cells show atypical mitotic figures. These tumor cells are densely admixed with uh, osteoclastic giant cells, which we have seen in the previous slide. The stroma is fibrocollagenous with numerous cystically dilated ducts. Few of these ducts show cribriform pattern and are, are also seen in solidness. The stroma is also infiltrated with chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate and also seen in areas of hemorrhage. So we come with a provisional diagnosis of uh, undifferentiated pancreatic carcinoma, the osteoclastic giant cell type. So basically it uh, primarily comprises of uh, three most important cellular elements, should be the mononuclear uh, new plastic cells, which we've already seen in the second and the third slide, uh, which can sometimes show some atypical mitotic figures. Uh, and sometimes we also see mononuclear histiocytes, which are the non-neoplastic component, and also seen are the multinucleated osteoclastic kind of giant cells. These also comprise the uh, non-neoplastic component. We've also seen foci of hemorrhage, uh, and uh, uh, it typically involves the pancreatic ductal tissue. Uh, so uh, in our case, uh, the patient is 65-year-old female, so there's a slight, uh, there's equal gender preponderance with a slightly increased female preponderance as seen with our case. And it's mainly seen in the sixth to the seventh decade of life. And our patient is 65 year old female. Commonly seen, the most common site would be the head of the pancreas uh, in about 75% of cases. The etiology is unknown for this case. Uh, we see, uh, could probably be because of chronic inflammation. Um, because of recruitment of uh, tumor supporting macrophages within the pancreatic tissue. Um, the patient usually comes in with uh, clinical features like jaundice. Uh, radiologically, uh, it can present uh, basically like uh, altered echogenic foci seen within the pancreas. The prognosis yes, is considered. Yes, ma'am. The screen looks frozen. It's not moving. Can you move the slides? Um, and the next one would be the differentials. The Prognosis is pure if it's associated with ductal adenocarcinoma. And the PDLI expression of the tumor is also associated with the poorer prognosis. The differential diagnosis for this case would be undifferentiated uh, anaplastic um, carcinoma of the pancreas. In this case, uh, there will be absence of osteoclastic giant cells, like which we have seen in our case. Uh, the other differential would be a paradiurnal groove pancreatitis. Uh, herein, the multinucleated giant cells may be abundant, but the neoplastic cells are lacking. But we have seen plenty of neoplastic cells in our case. Uh, the, uh, the third possible differential would be a melanoma. Um, here, this, contain, this kind of tumor contains melanin pigment instead of or in addition to the hemosiderin, and it's uh, S100 positive. So... Um, So coming to the coming to the IHC markers, the positive stains. Uh, uh, sorry, can we see the IHC? Is is the slide visible? Is the slide visible? The yes, IHC yes, markers? slide is visible. Yes, please, please continue. The IHC markers are positive, uh, basically for the neoplastic cells that we have seen the tumor cells, the cytokeratins, A one and A three, CK seven, CK eight, but. 18 and P53 is more, is positive in more than 50% of such cases and KI67 positivity. This all is for the neoplastic cells. So this can be done as a baseline um, IHC panel. 
For the histiocytes, uh, CD68 and CD163. For the multinucleated giant cells, CD68 and Cathepsin K. The histiocyte and multinucleated giant cells are the non-neoplastic kind of cells. So basically, if you're strongly thinking of the tumor cells per se, then probably go for the cytokeratins in the first place as the first panel of IHC. The negative stains now for the neoplastic would be, again, it's just the opposite, the vice versa. For neoplastic would be the CD68, CD163, S100, and CD45. For histiocytes and the multinucleated giant cells would be cytokeratins and P53. So um, this is, uh, thank you. Okay, so Dr. Smita, you have done a very good job. Actually, I think you came in my dreams or something and took my PPT and presented it. It looks like that. It is so exact, you know, all the pictures, the screenshots that I have taken of the IHC slides and your slides, of the HE slides and your slides and all the data, they'll all look same. So you have done a very good job. Thank you. Uh, so I think this was uh, quite a straightforward case. And basically, we put this case uh, uh, so because we wanted you to appreciate the morphology. We wanted you to see the whole slide and uh, pick up uh, the normal tissue as well as the abnormal tissue uh, in this case. So mm -hmm. you have done a very great job. So it was indeed an undifferentiated uh, carcinoma with osteoclast-like giant cells. So I will not go into too much of detail. I'll just uh, focus on some of the DDs and show you some pictures so that you can uh, remember these, uh, this case. So this was an elderly uh, middle-aged female uh, who basically presented with abdominal pain and decreased oral intake uh, for three months. She was a known diabetic and hypertensive for three years on oral medications. Uh, and uh, she also gave a family history of colon cancer in her grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, so on uh, scan, whether it was a CT, MRI or a PET CT, there was a large lesion which was arising in the body of the pancreas, which was measuring around uh, 10 to 11 centimeter in the greatest dimension. And it was also infiltrating the body of the stomach and the wall of the duodenum. And uh, she had lesions in the liver and also the bilateral adnexa. And uh, a biopsy uh, which was done elsewhere showed a, uh, was positive for malignant cells. It was actually an FNAB and we could not get much data on that. So she came to our hospital for further management. And here uh, they did a serum CEA and CA 19.9 which were uh, the tumor markers. The CA was normal but the 19.9 was uh, slightly elevated. So the provisional diagnosis, so the clinical diagnosis that was made by our surgeons was a primary pancreatic tumor with metastasis. They thought there were lesions in the liver and the adnexa so they thought this tumor has metastasized to uh, the liver and the adnexa so <laughs> what they did was they did a total pancreatectomy with spleenectomy uh, apparently the spleen was adherent uh, to the specimen to the uh, pancreatic mass and there was they uh, did a segmental resection of the small bowel a portion of duodenum was uh, removed as i told in the pet ct it was infiltrating the wall of the duodenum so a portion of the duodenum was removed and uh, because uh, there were lesions in the bilateral ovaries they also did a uh, total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral swelpingo oophorectomy so this was the mass this is the normal pancreatic tissue and this was the large uh, mass on sectioning which was uh, basically brownish uh, it was bulging and there were large cystic areas and areas of hemorrhage and necrosis and it was infiltrating the wall of the duodenum projecting into the duodenal wall okay so you also showed a similar picture of the normal pancreatic tissue and uh, this is the uh, interface of the tumor with the pancreas and uh, if you could make out there is this nice ductal lining and uh, there is this tumor projecting into this uh, 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 the duct like structure uh, forming a polypoidal uh, mass and on high power you could see areas of necrosis and there was no actual uh, glandular pattern or a particular pattern of arrangement the cells were arranged in sheets and uh, they were cohesive and uh, they were of or they had oval to spindled nuclei some of them had bizarre hypochromatic nuclei there were multinucleate uh, tumor giant cells there was necrosis and there were other giant cells which were not actually tumor giant cells but the osteoclast like giant cells along with the uh, the neoplastic cells. Again, you can see the benign ductal epithelium and the background is showing some inflammatory cells as well as these osteoclast-like giant cells. Uh, again, a high power view which is highlighting these osteoclast-like giant cells and the large tumor cells, uh, the atypical mitosis. Uh, 
a similar picture lot of atypical mitosis a largely pleomorphic tumor so this was bang on so we didn't think of anything else we thought it was an undifferentiated carcinoma with osteoclast like giant cells okay so we uh, thought of that but uh, we got some other responses most of you have uh, given the response of undifferentiated carcinoma with osteoclast like giant cells which was uh, perfect uh, uh, some of you have told undifferentiated carcinoma undifferentiated carcinosarcoma pleomorphic carcinoma sarcomatoid carcinoma somebody has told sarcomatoid undifferentiated carcinoma with rhabdoid morphology all these are the terminologies which come under the uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma the undifferentiated variant these are the subtypes but the term that i wanted you to use is the undifferentiated carcinoma with osteoclast like giant cells because this is the term that is uh, given by the who for this distinct entity and then some of you have also mentioned uh, lymphoma again as i say if you are thinking of lymphoma you think of either uh, with these large cells either diffuse large b cell lymphoma or the anaplastic large cell again they'll be more uh, discohesive they'll not be cohesive like this and you won't find these osteoclast like giant cells uh, in lymphoma another thing that you mentioned in your dd was chronic pancreatitis uh, yes this had a lot of inflammatory cells in the background but also tumor cells so you can't neglect the tumor cells and see only the inflammatory cells yes, okay uh, then the one person had told sclerosing epithelioid mesenchymal neoplasm again that is a distinct entity uh, but that doesn't have such bizarre looking cells it is basically a tumor which has epithelioid cells and spindle cells which are intermixed and it has a lot of inflammation in the background but such bizarre cells with a lot of atypical mitosis and osteoclast like giant cells won't be there in this entity okay somebody told uh, leomyosarcoma okay uh, you can think of a pleomorphic sarcoma coma but again these cells are there uh, these osteoclast like giant cells are there and uh, it is very pleomorphic and you can always do markers uh, like pan ck for confirmation as you told in your presentation uh, giant cell tumor of pancreas there is no such terminology it is basically a undifferentiated carcinoma with uh, osteoclast like giant cells okay so these are the differentials that uh, you thought and i thought and you already told about these uh, important thing is you should always uh, rule out melanoma as you mentioned because uh, as we all know melanoma is a great mimicker or it's also called as the great masquerader it can come anywhere and uh, always when you see an un undifferentiated tumor always do markers for melanoma at least s100 which you have already mentioned uh, which is fantastic okay thank you. thank you so okay so all these are the terminologies so accept this is from the who so this uh, these are the acceptable terminologies what you can say and again subtypes some person has told a large cell carcinoma with rhabdoid morphology again it is mentioned under the subtype of a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma so uh, this was the final diagnosis undifferentiated carcinoma with osteoclast like giant cells okay so it's basically uh, an undifferentiated carcinoma of the pancreas it doesn't have any glandular differentiation and it has prominent infiltration by the histiocytes and osteoclast like giant cells that is why the terminology and it is found in uh, it can or may not be found in association with a conventional ductal adenocarcinoma component okay and it's a distinctive neoplasm which occurs mostly in the pancreas rarely can be found in the bile ducts and other organs uh and uh, usually seen in elderly uh, uh, uh people and uh, the male to female ratio is almost equal the uh, epidemiology is the same and this it usually and it uh, it's uh, accounts to about 1.4% of all pancreatic cancers most commonly seen in the head of the pancreas uh the patients uh, usually present with jaundice because they usually come in the head of the pancreas or they may present with back pain weight loss nausea the exact pathophysiology is unknown but they say that because there is a lot of hemorrhage and uh, uh, necrosis within this tumor this inflammation and hemorrhage will recruit the tumor infiltrating macrophages and that is why the presence of these uh, histiocytes and the osteoclast giant cells within this uh, tumor okay uh, so gross pathology if you see a usual pancreatic uh, the uh, conventional ductal adenocarcinoma it's usually gray white and friable whereas uh, this uh, tumor is actually brown as i showed in my case and it has pushing borders and a lot of hemorrhage is present with cyst formation and necrosis microscopically you have uh, told there are three types of cells the mononuclear neoplastic cells the histiocytes which are non neoplastic and the osteoclast like giant cells uh, rarely osteoid material may also be found
okay you mentioned that you can do ihc for confirmation it's a morphological diagnosis you can always do an ihc for confirmation span ck may or may not come uh, p53 you will, will show the mutant type of staining in more than 50 percent of cases and ki is very high and the background uh, histiocytes and the osteoclast giant cells can be highlighted by histiocyte markers like uh, cd68 and cd163 okay uh, and coming to the molecular uh, uh, or the cytogenetics of this tumor as with conventional ductal adenocarcinoma most commonly mutated genes are the keras tp53 cdkn2a and smad4 and also mutations in gly3 and serpina3 have been found and uh, prognosis if only this uh, osteoclast like giant cell only this component is present without the conventional ductal adenocarcinoma it is thought to have a better prognosis if there is a conventional ductal component or a other component like a mucinous neoplasm it is associated with a poorer prognosis and you also mentioned pdl1 uh, as rightly said expression by tumor cells is associated with a poor prognosis okay so uh, very well presented and a very good diagnosis made thank you very much ma'am Thank okay, uh, just one uh, one spotter I will put and uh, you can reply to this and by the end of the next case, I'll go on to this. Okay, so this is a 28 year old female who presented with a pancreatic mass. Just have a look at this for one minute and I'll come back to it uh, at the end of my next case. Uh, you can uh, post your answers in the chat box. Okay, uh, shall I remove the slide? Okay, thank you. Shall I invite uh, you? Next yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, uh, case number six, Dr. Priyanka. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Priyanka, second year postgraduate from Sri Devra Jars Medical College. Coming to the case, 62-year-old female patient with complaints of tinnitus, biopsy of the middle ear soft tissue lesion was done. And then this is a whole mount view. And uh, here we can uh, see that uh, the tumor is uh, not encapsulated. And when we see uh, this part of the lesion, here we can see that tumor cells are arranged in sheets uh, in low power view. And on higher magnification, we can see that uh, tumor cells are round, around to spindly. And then tumor cells are uh, showing a bland nuclear with moderate amount of cytoplasm. Here we can see that also few nuclei are showing salt and pepper like chromatin. So now when coming to this uh, side of the lesion, so we can see that uh, tumor cells are arranged in nests and a uh, few and a uh, few nuclei are showing peripheral palisade. So the low power view we can uh, appreciate the peripheral palisade of uh, the nuclei and the tumor cells in nests. And then on the higher power, we can also see a rosette-like, pseudo-rosette-like structures, and then uh, large gaping blood vessels, and then a few swirling of the uh, tumor cells around the uh, blood vessel. And uh, microscopy section study from the lesion shows tumor cells arranged in sheets and glands. Individual tumor cells are predominantly round and few spindle shapes showing bland nucleus with moderate to scanned amount of cytoplasm. And few areas show peripheral palisading of the nucleus and occasional nuclei showing salt and pepper like chromatin. So large gaping blood vessels with swirling of tumor cells around the blood vessels were noted. And focal areas show pseudo rosette like uh, structures, no mitosis and no necrosis are noted. So with these points, I want to give differential diagnosis as middle ear adenoma, vestibular schwannoma, neuroblastoma like variant. So now coming, uh, coming to the points favoring for the middle ear adenoma. Uh, so it is, an not, it is not an encapsulated lesion. And here tumor cells are uh, seen arranged in sheets and glands. And um, plasma cytoid like cells are also seen and uh, some salt and pepper like uh, uh, chromatin is seen in some cells and then points against are large gaping blood vessels and few nuclei showing peripheral palisading pattern. So now coming to the vestibular schwannoma neuroblastoma like variant, uh, points favoring uh, for this uh, diagnosis is a uh, round to spindle shaped tumor cells with few uh, nuclei showing peripheral palisading, large uh, gaping blood vessels and uh, pseudo rosette like structures. And uh, points against are uh, usually schwannomas are in well encapsulated structure, but uh, this lesion is not encapsulated and few plasma cytoid like uh, cells are seen and the neuroendocrine like differentiation in few cells. 
So final diagnosis is it is a benign lesion. Possibility of middle ear adenoma and vestibular schwannoma, neuroblastoma like variant can be considered. I want to advise uh, HRCT of the temporal bone for further evaluation to know the tumor size and extension. And uh, I want to advise for immunohistochemistry of S100 and uh, chromogranin. These are my references. Thank you. Dr. Sulakshana, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. You presented very well. You came to the almost correct diagnosis. The diagnosis is correct, but the term is slightly different. So, uh, you told it is a middle ear adenoma and you gave a, diagno a main differential of a vestibular schwannoma. Okay. So, I'll just a few points uh, about this case. A 62-year-old female who uh, complained of tinnitus and a biopsy of middle ear soft tissue lesion was done. So, you showed very good Im uh, images. As uh, you said, this tumor was arranged in nests and at places uh, arranged in cribriform glands. Some tubules were there and at places you also showed there was some peripheral palisading because of which you thought it was a schwannoma. Uh, that is very good. Uh, yes, the background was uh, fibrocollagenous, not exactly, exactly fibrillary. And I think uh, you also mentioned about pseudo rosettes. Okay, so here on high power view, we can see that uh, the tumor cells are arranged in some kind of tubules and nests. Okay, and uh, on, on further high power, you can appreciate the uh, salt and pepper chromatin of these cells and they have abundant granular cytoplasm. So overall, it's a bland looking tumor, uh, no mitosis, no necrosis. Uh, and uh, these, I think you thought these were pseudo rosettes. Okay, this one, okay, uh, not yes, exactly rosettes. And uh, no fibrillary background. It was a fibrocollagenous background. Okay, so uh, this uh, this the differentials that we received were uh, middle ear adenoma. Uh, now this terminology has been removed in the WHO. Uh, okay, so and uh, now it is uh, with these features that is the neuroendocrine-like features of the uh, cells. It is called as a middle ear neuroendocrine tumor. Okay, so this middle ear adenoma is no longer used. So you were almost right. This was a middle ear neuroendocrine tumor. The other, uh, the closest differential that uh, we thought was a paraganglioma because of the nesting pattern. Uh, again, a paraganglioma. Sorry. Again, in a paraganglioma, you can see that uh, the tumor cells are arranged in the classic gel balloon pattern. And the nuclear features that this that is the salt and pepper chromatin will not be present. They will have a more kind of a pseudo inclusions uh, and they will show some kind of a, a nuclear pleomorphism. Uh, other, other than that, you thought of glomus tumor or glomangioma. Some of them have sent. Uh, glomus tumors are more, uh, uh, the cells will be more smaller and with scanty cytoplasm. Uh, they will have the characteristic punched out nucleus and not the salt and pepper type of chromatin. Uh, the other DDs that we received were MPNHT. There was no pleomorphism in this and uh, no mitosis or decrosis. So MPNHT is ruled out. Uh, then some also thought of a meningioma. Uh, meningioma, the cells will be more in a syncytial pattern and the nuclear features will be, uh, you'll see, you may see grooves or you may see intranuclear inclusions, not the salt and pepper type of chromatin. Uh, some of them have sent PNET. Uh, PNET, again, in the middle year, uh, it is very rare uh, to think of PNET, uh, maybe because of the nuclear features, the salt and pepper chromatin, you thought of that. Again, it will have a more scanty cytoplasm when compared to this and the background will be more fibrillary and you may uh, see pseudo rosettes in that. Uh, uh, some have also sent uh, BCC. I don't know one person why they thought of BCC. Maybe because at places uh, there were some cribriform glands. Uh, so you thought of BCC. The BCC uh, will be more smaller cells and bacilloid and more uniform rounded nuclei with inconspicuous nucleoli. Schwannoma is a very good differential diagnosis uh, because of the background, uh, the palisading of the cells and the background being pink. But again, in a uh, schwannoma, in a neural tumor, you also have to see, look for any sclerosed, uh, thick walled blood vessels in the background. So this was a middle ear uh, neuroendocrine tumor. The term middle ear adenoma was used initially for it, but now it has been uh, removed from, uh, uh, the term is not recommended to be used. Okay, so this so we went ahead and did some markers for confirmation. So basically, we did the pan cytokeratin, uh, which was uh, positive within the 
tumor cells. And then uh, we also did uh, for, uh, tum uh, markers for neuroendocrine differentiation like synaptophysin and chromogranin, which showed granular uh, positivity. And the proliferation index, that is the KI67, was uh, low, which was uh, uh, less, one, around 1 to 2%. Uh, we also did markers to uh, um, to rule out a vascular tumor that is CD34, which highlighted only the blood vessels and the tumor cells were negative. And S100 again was negative, some faint uh, non-specific staining was there, uh, basically to rule out a paraganglioma and a neural tumor. Okay, so this is again uh, your schwannoma is out and. Uh, Paraganglioma is out, CD34 negative, so no vascular tumor. Positive for epithelial and neuroendocrine markers. So basically, this is a middle ear neuroendocrine tumor, MENET. Okay. So this is a benign glandular neoplasm which uh, uh, arises from the middle ear mucosa, showing both neuroendocrine and epithelial differentiation. It affects all the sites in the middle ear. There is no gender preference. Usually, in the 20s uh, uh, to 40s year old uh, age groups are affected. Patients present with uh, hearing changes, fullness or ear pressure and tinnitus and uh, rarely it may perforate the tympanic membrane and extend into the external auditory canal. So uh, uh, the pathogenesis is st uh, still unknown but they say that uh, the, the L, there are some L cells which are the neuroendocrine cells within the middle ear mucosa from which these are thought to arise from. And the prognosis is excellent. Uh, rarely is locally aggressive. It invades, uh, and sometimes it may invade vital structures and may have regional metastasis. So this middle ear adenoma, as you said, that uh, terminology is not recommended. Initially, it was also called neuroendocrine adenoma or carcinoid tumor, adenomatous tumor, or adenocarcinoid. Okay, so grossly, it is a uh, the average, uh, the mean size is around 0.8 centimeter. It's a small, non-encapsulated, well-circumscribed uh, tumor, as you said in your uh, presentation. And it is gray-white to uh, firm, rubbery. And uh, the patterns we have already described, it may look, the cells may look plasma cytoid and they may produce PS positive mucin. Uh, the stroma is myxoid, it's not fibrillary. And the mitosis are rare, there is no necrosis. IHC, as I uh, mentioned, uh, it's positive for uh, cytokeratin and neuroendocrine markers. And also transcription factors like INSM1, IS1 and SATP2 and may co-express CDX2 and GATA3. But it is negative for TTF1. We also did TTF1 and P63, which were negative. Uh, it may produce some hormones like glucagon, pancreatic polypeptide, and pancreatic peptide Y, and serotonin. Uh, the KI, that is the proliferation index, is very low, less than 2%. But if it is more than 20%, it is uh, associated with an aggressive behavior. And uh, more than 20%, now grading systems uh, are being formed to grade them as uh, NET grade 1, 2, and 3. But it's still under investigation. The treatment of choice is complete surgical excision and if it is large you may have to do a mastoidectomy and if it's inadequate excision such cases may recur. So this was a middle ear neuroendocrine tumor, a classic uh, uh, morphological diagnosis which needs IHC for confirmation. So thank you, very good presentation Dr. Priyanka. Hello, you are able to hear me? Ah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so again, I put one more spotter. Okay, this was a 72 year old male who presented with right facial nerve palsy and right external ear canal polyps. So I'll keep it for one minute. The previous one, uh, all of you have uh, made a very good diagnosis. That was actually a SPEN, a solid papillary uh, uh, neoplasm. So most of you have sent SPEN. So well done. So just look at this slide and then. Uh, I'll move, I'll call the next presenter to present this. You can uh, type type in the answers for this, and after the next presenter's talk, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was a well structured and easy to follow presentation. A valuable contribution to the topic at hand. Thank you for that. Now I would call uh, case number seven, Dr. Poonika. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, can I share my PPT now? Yeah, please introduce yourself and share your screen. Okay, I'm Dr. Purnika Tombram from Sri Siddhartha Medical College, and I will be presenting the case number seven. Uh, 
Uh, so the case given was 22 year old male, 3 into 2 centimeter from swelling in the occipital area of the scalp on the right side since 2 years and excision biopsy was done. So um, the section studied, it shows a well circumscribed pseudo encapsulated lesion. And uh, as we go, uh, we can see the arrangement of the cells uh, in sheets and focal areas. It shows the uh, story form pattern and also in the interlacing fascicles. And uh, as we go to the higher powers, we can see that the tumor cells, they are arranged in uh, nodules. Um, so coming to the individual cells, we can see that uh, these are the spindle shaped cells with round to oval uh, nu vesicular nucleus, having this prominent nucleoli and scan to moderate amount of eosinophilic cytoplasm. And also mitotic figures are noted, few mitotic figures are noted. And uh, this is also a higher power view showing the spindle shaped cells. Uh, so, and also we can see these uh, areas of hemorrhages with the hemosiderin pigments and these areas are like, um, this is the blood lakes which are not actually lined by the endothelial lining and also many blood vessels are noted which are lined by the endothelial cells and uh, they are filled with the RBCs. And vacuolated, uh, in one focus, we can see uh, there is a vacuolated cells uh, which are suggestive of the lipid within the tumor cells. And uh, tentacles like extension from the tumors are also noted, which are surrounded by the inflammatory infiltrates comprising of uh, this plasma lymphocytic infiltrate. And adjacent to it, we can see the skeletal muscles and also the adipose tissue. So coming to my differential diagnosis, um, I would like to uh, rule out this uh, deep uh, fibrous uh, histiocytoma because it is more prominent, uh, like um, the storyform pattern will be more prominent and the blands will be, uh, cells will be cytologically bland uh, and uh, mitotic figures are absent. So I would like to rule this out. And also it is aneurysmal fibrous histiocytoma. There will be numerous uh, blood filled cavernous cavity cavities without this endothelial lining and also arranged in the tight storyform pattern. So and uh, mitosis will be present around the blood vessels. So I would like to rule this out also. And angioliomyoma of solid variant, uh, it is, uh, the, there will be a capsule and also this, uh, there is a smooth muscle bundles uh, which are closely compact and intersect with one another. And a large number of vascular channels which are small in size and slit like. Uh, but uh, here uh, it is um, most commonly there will be mitosis will be absent, but rarely it can be present also. And coming to angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma, uh, there will be avoid to spindle shaped cells with vesicular nucleus and often arranged in nodules, pseudo angiomatoid spaces will be present, pseudo capsule and lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and mitosis will be present. Uh, coming to my summary, it is um, a well circumscribed pseudo encapsulated lesion with tumor cells uh, which are arranged in sheets, focal areas uh, with the story form pattern, interlacing for cycles and in nodules, spindle shaped cells with round to oval nucleus, uh, having prominent nucleoli and scan to moderate amount of eosinophilic cytoplasm, areas of hemorrhage with hemosiderin pigments and many vascular spaces lined by endothelial uh, cells are noted with few mitotic figures, plasma lymphocytic infiltrates are also seen Seen and uh, there is no necrosis and uh, no degeneration seen. Uh, so after, uh, as after noting all the point, the age, uh, the site and the microscopic feature, I would like to come to my diagnosis as angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma and we can do the ISC marker uh, uh, CD68, EMA, CD99, CD34, S100 protein, keratin, CD31 and HMB45. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Purnika. Mm, thank you. Yes, can you see my PPT now? Yes. So good afternoon one and all. So I congratulated Dr. Purnika on her very detailed uh, description and she's noted all the finer points. Um, I would like to show you a few additional points. See, okay. uh, so this uh, she already describes a 22 year old male, three into two centimeter firm swelling in the occipital area of scalp on the right uh, side. Uh, and patient had it for two years and excision biopsy was done. So um, as she has described, it was a well circumscribed lesion. She has called it pseudo encapsulated. I agree with that. And what is this you see in the periphery? You see some small 
structures here all around the tumor. Yeah. What is this structure you see in the periphery of the tumor, just outside the capsule? You can see this in other places. This is a nerve bundle. And this you have described, it's a very cellular tumor composed of, you said, spindle cells. I agree with that, but are you seeing only spindle cells? Uh, Ma'am, round to avoid uh, histocyte-like cells are also seen. Yes, in the soft tissue neoplasm, when you see this kind of cells, you will say they are epithelioid morphology. Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. They are not all spindly, right? So, yes, it is a well-circumscribed cellular neoplasm, which has nerve bundles in the periphery. You can uh, go back to the morphology images and check. There are uh, nerve bundles all around the tumor. In fact, this area you described as tentacles are actually nerve bundles. You can see in detail. And then, uh, considering all your DDs, I do agree with the presence of blood vessels. Um, can you describe some particular pattern of blood vessels here? Mom, those are slit-like spaces. Like, yes. Uh, are they big blood-filled spaces as you see in the angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma? Or do you think in this low-power view, is this blood vessel component a predominant component? No, ma'am. Yes. So, let's move on. So, we see this population of epithelioid and spindle cells, I agree, yes. but predominantly epithelioid cells, which have very pleomorphic vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli. And are these nucleoli, do you think they're eosinophilic or basophilic? Ma'am, they're basophilic. Yes, and they have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Coming to this higher power view, you can note a moderate degree of neoplasm, uh, pleomorphism, and presence of atypical mitosis. There are not many in number, but you can see atypical mitosis. So, um, these are the responses we received. So, majority of uh, the students call this an MPNST. Uh, seven students call this a schwannoma. Some said synovial sarcoma, some said follicular dendritic cell sarcoma. So, most of them are thinking of a, a soft tissue neoplasm, and most of them think it is malignant. There are two candidates who thought it is a melanoma as well. One candidate said it's an epithelioid MPNST. Now, I will show you the IHC findings and then we will come back to differentials. So, can you describe the IHC now? Uh, ma'am, it is positive, ma'am. S100 is positive. Yes, S100 shows strong and diffuse. You will say this is strong and diffuse uh, uh, nuclear and cytoplasmic expression of S100. And SOX10, can you describe the SOX10? Ma'am, a, a pattern few, of staining. Ma'am, few areas are in the corner to like showing this positivity, ma'am. SOX10 in this case, I would say is diffusely positive. SOX10, remember, is a nuclear marker and it is diffusely staining this population. And what is this marker? HMB45 is negative. Ma'am, this is there is, negative. Yes, there is some non-specific staining, but otherwise mm -hmm. it is stained. So I have done this panel. Apart from this, other markers were done, like pancytokeratin was negative, SMA was negative, Desmin was negative, CD34 was highlighting all the blood vessels. Those are the negative markers. So that is the basic panel you choose for a soft tissue neoplasm. You choose a pancytokeratin, S100s, SMA, Desmin, CD34, and you'll also do a KS67. For those of you who thought this could be benign, see the KI67. Can you take a guess? Yes, ma'am. It is proliferate. It is high, ma'am. Yes, I would say something like 25 or 30 percent, mm -hmm. right? And what is this marker? Mm -hmm. INI1. Can you interpret this INI1? Ma'am, is it nuclear positivity, ma'am? See, nuclear positivity is there in a few cells, which are the lymphocytes here. But these are the tumor cells I'm pointing out. They are negative. So basically, we have a circumscribed neoplasm, which is positive for neural markers, negative for HMV45. Hence, we have excluded a melanoma or a clear cell sarcoma. And we have a moderately high KI67. So with a combined with an epithelioid morphology, we'll come to a, di a diagnosis of epithelial malignant peripheral nerve shape tumor. So, the essential criteria for an MPNSD is a sarcoma arising from a nerve or a pre-existing nerve sheet tumor or in a patient in NF1. 
The tumors with the spindles to fascicular growth, geographic necrosis, and often a limited degree of nuclear pleomorphisms are labeled MPNSD. In the sporadic setting, diagnosis is made on the basis of identification of Schwann cell differentiation, which is defined by S100 or Soxton focal positivity and or loss of this new marker H3K27ME3 expression. Epithelial MPNSDs, however, are an exception to this rule and they occur outside NF1 setting and show diffuse S100 and Soxton positivity and loss of SMARC B1, which is defined by which can be highlighted by INI1 loss. MPNSD is rare and uh, uh, constitutes approximately 2, 3 to 5 percent of all soft tissue sarcomas. We call an MPNSD as epithelial MPNSD when more than or equal to 50 percent of the tumor cells are polygonal and they are, have a nodular arrangement. And this epithelial MPNSD accounts for only 5 percent of all the MPNSDs. And it has distinct, it is, remember, it is distinct from the conventional MPNSD. So the most common locations of MPNSD are the trunk and the extremities, followed by head and neck, and they're typically seen in the young age group. Uh, rarely they can see in children, especially when they're associated with NF1. And it presents as an enlarging, painful or painless mass. Neuropathic symptoms such as motor weakness, paresthesias, or radical pain may be seen. There are no specific imaging characteristics that can be detected on the MRI, except for origin from a large nerve, or in the case of NF1, and we can see the origin from a pre-existing neurofibroma. So MPNSTs may occur in association with irradiation or in um, uh, in the case of NF1. In NF1, there, uh, there is a progression from plexiform neurofibroma to an atypical neurofibroma or this atypical neural tumor of uncertain biological potential, which is called ANNUBP. And this further progresses to MPNSD. And as this happens, there is progressive genomic alterations that inactivate NF1, P16, and PRC2 pathways. And we uh, can see loss of H3K27ME3 expression. This is a useful diagnostic tool in high-grade MPNSD, not very sensitive in low-grade MPNSDs. However, epithelial MPNSDs are distinct from conventional MPNSDs, and they show smark b one gene inactivation, which can be detected by smark b one loss by IHC. Now, this is the macroscopic appearance when there is a, an association with a nerve which shows fusiform enlargement. And MPNSDs are usually more than 5 cm in size at the time of diagnosis and have a tan white fleshy cut surface, often with areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. Now, this is a conventional MPNSD. We see this marbling or tapestry arrangement where you see hypercellular areas and hypocellular areas. This was not seen in our case. So, the cells are spindly, as we see here, often monomorphic, and they have a serpentine or a wavy morphology, and geographic necrosis may be seen. And we can see heterologous differentiation, such as skeletal muscle, bone, cartilage, and blood vessels, in approximately 15% of the tumors. Now, what is a triton tumor? When you have an MPNSD showing this rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, identified by these pink cytoplasm with striations, that is called a malignant triton tumor. Then you may, might also see glandular differentiation, which is called glandular MPNSD. Epithelioid MPNSD is composed of plump epithelioid, epithelioid cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, and they typically show a lobulated growth pattern, as you showed in your photographs. Now, coming to the IHC, MPNSD is maybe positive by S100, SOX10, and GFAP, but this is usually patchy or focal. So, this is a conventional MPNSD showing very focal patchy S100. Often, we might have to do S100 on multiple sections to, determine, to find positivity uh, to establish the lineage. So, diffuse staining for S100 or SOX10 is not usually compatible with the diagnosis of conventional MPNSD. And complete loss of staining for this new marker. Please remember this marker H3K27ME3 uh, in high grade tumors is seen. But unlike conventional MPNSDs, epithelial MPNSDs show strong diffuse staining for S100 in SOX10. They show absent melanoma markers and retained this H3K27ME3. And they show loss of SMARC B1, which is INI1. So the closest differentials for this tumor with this epithelial morphology in the scalp location in a subcutaneous, remember in our case, there was no overlying skin, the skin was not removed, it was only a subcutaneous swelling. The differentials would be one, a melanoma, two, a clear cell sarcoma. So uh, the lack of expression of melanocytic markers like melan A, HMB45 and MITF is helpful in distinguishing epithelial MPNST from melanoma and clear cell sarcoma. 
and then the other differentials would be an epithelioid sarcoma and a carcinoma as well. Absent cytokeratin expression distinguishes this from carcinoma and epithelioid sarcoma. But pitfall here is both epithelioid MPNST and epithelioid sarcomas may show loss of INI1 protein. So often a panel of markers is required for diagnosis. So now what is this case which shows a uh, very cellular neoplasm with areas of geographic necrosis, hyperview showing epithelioid morphology, high mitotic activity with loss of INI1. Dr. Purnika? Yes, ma'am. So, what is this case? Suppose I say it is distal extremity. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, can it be uh, shown? See, this is a high grade tumor with areas of geographic necrosis. See, geographic necrosis, epithelial morphology, high grade nuclear features, and loss of INI1. Suppose uh, the location distal extremity. Um, can it be epithelial sarcoma? Yes, epithelial sarcoma of the distal type. Now, what is this tumor, which is dermal in location, extending up to the epidermis but not involving it? The cells have Vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and clear cytoplasm. And these might be positive for melanoma markers. So, what will you call it? Mm. It would be a dermal clear cell sarcoma. Okay. You can demonstrate EWSR gene rearrangement in such cases. So, MPNST is an aggressive tumor with poor prognosis and it shows truncal, uh, when there is truncal location, tumor size more than 5 cm and uh, features like local recurrence and high grade morphology, they are all adverse prognostic factors. And patients with NF1 associated MPNST have worse prognosis than patients with sporadic tumors. Malignant triton tumors are particularly aggressive. However, there is scant literature on epithelioid MPNST. So, uh, there is a large series which reported a favorable outcome as compared to conventional MPNST, but there are other studies which have reported an aggressive biological behavior. So, we come to end of case 7. This is a spot I would like to show you. So, this patient was 42 year old male who presented with a mass or an induration in the tongue. So, I would like you to make the diagnosis and name one special stain and two IHC markers which would help in diagnosis. So, I will give you the answers at the end of my presentation. Yes, I think we can move on to the to case number eight. Number eight, Dr. A.B. Susan Thomas. Yes, can I share my PPT now? Yes, please introduce yourself and share it. Uh, myself, Dr. A.B. Susan Thomas from ESIC Medical College, Rajaji Nagar. I'll be presenting the eighth case. So, case number eight, a 65-year-old male evaluated for obstructive jaundice on UGI endoscopy, uh, growth in the periampullary region, and the biopsy was done. So, uh, the section studied show a polypoid uh, lesion lined by columnar epithelium from... Uh, uh, sorry, below sorry to interrupt. Uh, Dr. I.B., I can't see your presentation. Can you share your PPT? Yes, I can see it now. Please go ahead. Shall I start from the beginning? No, go on, go on. Go on to the microscopy. Section studies show a polypoid structure lined by columnar epithelium forming villi and cribs. And the submucosa is edematous and the epithelium is denuded at some places. The lamina propria shows extensive proliferation of small capillary sized blood vessels and lymphatic channels along with chronic inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes and plasma cells. The submucosa is edematous and comprises of dilated and congested blood vessels. The submucosa shows a diffuse lesion comprised of ganglion-like cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, distinct cell border, eccentrically placed nucleus, and prominent nucleoli interspersed in a Schwannian stroma. Here we can see those ganglion-like cells and uh, Schwannian stroma. These Schwann cells are narrow, elongated so, baby cells with tapered point. ends. Uh, your screen is frozen. Please move to the next.
yes proceed the schwann cells are narrow elongated wavy cells with tapered ends and having dense chromatin uh, also these tumor cells are seen to be intermixed with cystically dilated glands these glands are lined by tall columnar cells and smooth uh, this is interspersed with smooth muscle bundles and there are lymphoid aggregate scenes which is not forming lymphoid follicle summarize the section studied show a polypoid structure lined by columnar epithelial cells forming villi and crypts epithelium is denoted at places the lamina propria shows extensive proliferation of small capillary sized blood vessels and lymphatic channels along with chronic inflammatory infiltrated plasma cells and lymphocytes submucosa is edematous and shows a diffuse lesion comprised of ganglion like cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm eccentrically placed nucleus it is interspersed in a schwannian stroma tumor cells are seen to be intermixed with cystically dilated glands and smooth muscle bundles also noted that prolapsed submucosal branner glands and lymphoid aggregates so my differential diagnosis are uh, could be a ganglioneuroma or ganglioneuroblastoma intermixed style so ganglioneuroma it comprises of ganglion cells and schwann cells there is no significant atypia or mitosis or necrosis it is a well differentiated tumor and the ganglioneuroblastoma is a poorly differentiated tumor which consists of neuroblast ganglion cells and schwann cells this neuroblast will form a homeroid pseudo rosette with minimal cytoplasm round to avoid nuclei with salt and pepper chromatin and inconspicuous nucleoli the ihc uh, which uh, can be done uh, for neuroblast is neuron specific enolysis and cd56 for ganglion cells s100 synaptophysin chromogranin a and uh, gfap uh, thank you dr ib so i congratulate you on a very detailed um, clear description you come very close i'll show you my ihc findings then we'll discuss further so a 65 year old male was evaluated for obstructive jaundice on upper gi endoscopy they found a growth in the periampullary region because uh, there was a diagnostic dilemma i think uh, this was a biopsy was taken sent for frozen section and then a polypectomy was done So this is the low power view showing duodenal mucosa. It is almost a polypoid lesion uh, lined by duodenal mucosa. See here a slightly higher power view showing benign glands and villi. You can identify duodenum by the presence of Brunner glands here. And this is the muscularis mucosa. And here we see this lesion, uh, which is composed of. predominantly spindle cells in a schwannian kind of stroma i am happy you appreciated that so this is the lesion i i find from the list of differentials that people had difficulty in identifying the lesion so this is the lesion in the low power view you can see that this area appears very cellular however the mucosa is quite normal now higher power view we can see this spindle cells as uh, dr ib described so they are set in a schwannian stroma they look bland with wavy buccal nuclei and what are these cells dr ib what are these cells? cells yes they are ganglion cells so this was a frozen section so you can expect some artifacts but you see this polygonal cells with vesicular nuclei prominent nucleoli and abundant eosinophilic granular cytoplasm so these are ganglion cells you can see a lot of them for those who have not seen i would uh, suggest you go back to the morphal slides and check again so there are a lot of these cells if you see very carefully some of them are seen in small clusters this gives a clue to the diagnosis ganglion cells again there are also these small nests of cells which going between the muscularis mucosa bundles so the tumor is located in the submucosa and infiltrating the muscularis mucosa here they are forming small nests these cells have small round nuclei inconspicuous nucleoli and eosinophilic cytoplasm now these are the spindle cells with a schwannian stroma so this is the list of differentials i received so some people have called it a periampullary adenocarcinoma i would like to point out that the glands are looking very benign and bland and those other glands which you might see uh, could be uh the openings of the i mean because this is periampullary biopsy you can see bile duct opening and opening of the pancreatic ducts but there's no atypia to call this malignancy 
an ampullary adenoma will be uh, will have either villus or tubular architecture again there it is defined by the presence of dysplasia which might be low grade or high grade that is not seen in our case so some uh, one person has called it a bile duct adenoma uh, three people have called it a vascular lesion uh, there are a lot of lymphatics and some people have uh, called it adenomyoma so adenomyoma will have scattered smooth muscle bundles and glands but you're not seeing glands in between the spindle cells and one person has called it co -GNET. So this is our ISC findings. So we saw those nests of cells and they showed, uh, can you describe this, Dr. I.B.? Synaptophysin is positive for the tumor cells. Yes, in which component do you think this is? Uh, that uh, Schwannian's uh, stroma, no? Uh, not really. They are the small nests because Schwannian's stroma is there throughout the lesion. Uh, if you see chromogranin also, it is not that component, spindle cell component, which is staining, but there are small cells. nests. Yes, there are small cells, small nests of cells which are staining for synaptophysin and chromogranin. And the pattern of staining is cytoplasmic granular staining. And this is S100. So it is diffusely staining the spindle cell component. And what are these cells which are positive for S100? It's a high power view. Ganglion cells. Yes. So we have three components. We have one component which has small nests of cells staining for neuroendocrine markers. We have these spindle cells which are stained by S100 and we have these ganglion cells. Now can you put all three together? You have called this a ganglio, rightly called it ganglioneuroma without IHC because you have seen the spindle cells as well as the ganglion cells. Can you add uh, the neuroendocrine component to this and give a final diagnosis? Could be uh, Composite uh, ganglion neuroma with the neuroendocrine. Yes, you're right. So these are the other markers. So progesterone receptor staining for staining those small nests of cells. Ki yeah, six to seven is quite low. And these are the gist markers. I'm surprised uh, nobody had uh, has made a differential diagnosis of gist. Um, CCD one one seven and dog one was done and it was negative. So, composite gangliocytoma uh, slash neuroma and neuroendocrine tumor is co -GNET. Do you know the old name for this entity? Dr. I.B.? Okay, we'll go ahead. So, uh, this was previously called gangliocytic paraganglioma. So, the essential criteria for this was triphasic differentiation with variable neuroendocrine epithelial cells, spindle cells with Schwannian differentiation and ganglion cells. So, desirable criteria is location in the periampillary region of the duodenum. So, the location case history gives the clue in this case. Extreme rare cases have been reported in jejunum, pylorus and other sites. So, they might present with GI bleeding, non-specific epigastric pain, biliary and intestinal obstruction. And most, because this is a paraganglioma, remember, they might be functional, but most cases are non-functional. And when they are functional, they usually produce somatostatin and pancreatic polypeptide. So, these occur in the sixth decade of life and uh, with a male preponderance and most cases are sporadic, though rare cases have been reported in setting of neurofibromatosis type 1. And these are derived from a defective sheet of intraembryonal uh, endodermal progenitor cells, neuroectodermal cells and smooth muscle and around 20% have somatic gain of function mutations in HIF2A. So, the macroscopic appearance are so, this is the endoscopy appearance where in the region of the uh, second part of duodenum, in the periampillary region, you see this sessile or pedunculate. Most often, it is a polypoid lesion and the size is usually small, only 2 to 3 mm in size. However, when it occurs in the pancreatic head, they are larger, 4 cm in size. They are typically centered in the submucosa. This is the CT picture showing projection into the lumen of the duodenum. This is when a this is not from our case, but this is how a polypectomy might look and it shows this lesion here. And the cut surface shows gray, tan or yellow white appearance and the overlying mucosa may be ulcerated, but there is, um, uh, the glands are normal. So, the three distinct components I described already, epithelial cell component, spindle cell Schwannian component and the ganglion cell components which are intermixed with each other. Mitosis are rare, cytological ATP is minimal and necrosis is absent. Any one or all these three components may be present in metastasis. And when you come to ILC, almost all epithelial cells express pancytokeratin, bromogranin A, synaptophysin, CD56, NSE and PR. Pancreatic polypeptide and somatostatin may also be expressed. Spindle cells express SOX10, S100, NSE and BCL2. 
Ganglion cells express S100, CD56, NSE, and synaptophysin, but are negative for FOX10. So closest differentials in this case, because the predominant component is spindle cell component, so the closest DD would be a GIST. In anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract, you will have to consider GIST and do markers. CK10 DOG1 should be done and it will be negative in this case. And anyway, we don't expect uh, the presence of neuroendocrine um, cell nests and ganglions. And a leomyoma, if you consider, ISC should be done and ISC desmoid will be negative and all three components will not be seen. Schwannoma, it lacks the epithelial and the ganglion cell components. A neuroendocrine tumor will lack the spindle and the ganglion cell components. Ganglion neuroma lacks the epithelial component. And paraganglioma, if it is TD, you will not have diffuse staining of S100. S100 will stain only the sustentaculous cells, which are arranged around the nest of epithelial cells. And pancytokeratin will be negative. So, even the histochemistry for PR and pancreatic polypeptide, while not specific, will be useful in diagnosis of this lesion. The prognosis, co-GNET are indolent, but do not recur after, and usually do not recover after complete um, removal. However, lymph node metastasis is reported in 10 to 14.5% of cases, and liver metastasis in 1% of cases. There are no histological factors which are predictive of metastasis. A tumor size more than 2 cm, young age group and submucosal invasion could be risk factors for lymph node metastasis. Pancreatic cogenitis have a greater potential for malignant behavior. However, due to lack of validated predictive factors, um, all cogenet should be regarded as potentially malignant and long-term follow-up is recommended. So, thank you. So, the answer to my spotter is granular cell tumor. So, I see a lot of people have made the diagnosis. Uh, and um, so, special stains, pass D should be used and IHC. So, it is pass positive, diastase resistant, and IHC S100 and CD68 are positive. So, thank you. Thank you, Anandra. Thank now you. I'll uh, hand over to the next presenter. Your presentation was engaging and kept it captivated throughout. Me. Thank you for that. Now, I would like to call uh, case number nine, Dr. Shreyanka. Yes, ma'am. Can I share my PPT, ma'am? And share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Is my PPT visible, ma'am? Yes, yes. It is visible. Put it in full screen mode. Is this fine, ma'am? No, it has not yet gone to full screen. Now, ma'am. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Shriyanka. I'm a second year postgraduate from the Department of Pathology, Gulbarga Institute of Medical Sciences, Kalbarki. I'll be presenting case number nine. So the given history was a 59-year-old female uh, presented with pancytopenia under evaluation, suspicious of uh, aplastic anemia. Clinically, she presented with the weakness, pallor, and pedal edema. The hemoglobin given was 5.1 gram per dl. Total count was 1,290 per cubic mm. Platelet count was 26,000 per cubic mm. The differential count given was neutrophils being 7.7%. Lymphocytes were 87.6%. Monocytes were 3.1%. And eosinophils were 1.6%. And base of being 0%. Uh, so, the given slide A is a bone marrow aspirate smear showing scanty cellularity with few bone marrow fragments. Uh, so, these are the bone marrow fragments that are seen on high path. Multiple areas uh, show cluster of cells that are twice the size of mature lymphocytes and contain nucleus that is round to oval with few cells showing indentation here. 
uh, with uh, granular chromatin and inconspicuous nucleoli. These cells have abundant basophilic cytoplasm showing villous projections. Uh, very few late erythroblasts here yeah, and uh, also occasional plasma cells were seen. Uh, in same cluster of cells were seen in different areas of the smear and no other myeloid series cells and mega sites were noted. The other slide given was a bone marrow biopsy section which shows both hypercellular as well as quasi-cellular areas. The marrow cavity shows a diffuse infiltration of monotonous population of cells uh, with preserving the marrow adipose tissue. So um, here we can see the cells are widely spaced with condensed nuclear chromatin surrounded by a pure zone with a distinct cell border which is giving it a fried egg appearance. And also uh, the erythroid lineage and myeloid lineage cells are reduced with only few megakaryocytes were noted. Also seen are some areas of reticulant fiber deposition. With all these morphological findings, we have narrowed down to differential diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia, hairy cell leukemia variant, splenic marginal zone lymphoma, splenic diffuse red pulp small B cell lymphoma. Now here, because of the uh, cytoplasmic villus projections, uh, we have come to the diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia here. Uh, whereas hairy cell leukemia variant, uh, usually they'll present with a higher total count. Uh, so uh, we are uh, trying to rule out hairy cell leukemia variant here. And coming to splenic marginal zone lymphoma and splenic diffuse red uh, pulp small B cell lymphoma, uh, usually they have a characteristic intrasinusoidal infiltration in the bone marrow, which is not seen in this case. Uh, therefore, we have narrowed down to a provisional diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. Uh, for further confirmation, uh, we should be doing IHCs uh, for CD20 and also TRAP uh, that is tartarate resistant acid phosphatase has to be done and DBA44 and annexin A1 which is more specific to HCL, uh, hairy cell leukemia has to be done. And also flow cytometry for CD25, 103 and CD123 can be done, which would help us to rule out other uh, differential diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sriyanka. So that was an excellent presentation. Actually, this case was uh, uh, at the end of it, I feel like it should have been kept for a spotter <laughs> because most of the answers were uh, given as hairy cell leukemia. And uh, you have highlighted all the important points uh, as far as morphology goes. But there was certain reason why we kept this case. Now, as you can see from the history, this uh, patient uh, presented to us with pancytopenia. Uh, and uh, there was on examination, there was no hepatosplenomegaly. So, Dr. Sriyanka, um, do you uh, think uh, without uh, splenomegaly, we can still think of hairy cell leukemia? Uh, no, ma'am. Splenomegaly is, uh, is a feature of hairy cell leukemia. It is a feature, a very important feature, clinical feature of uh, uh, hairy cell leukemia. And hence, even the clinician's working diagnosis was aplastic anemia. And uh, uh, on the peripheral smear, we really did not find many uh, hairy cells. That's why the uh, bone marrow was done. Now, this is the CBC. Uh, always start your diagnosis in a hematology lab with a CBC. And do not forget to look at the scatter plots. Okay. So, as you can see, she, uh, Dr. Shreyanka has already given us the counts. And uh, what I want you to see is that monocyte count was, there was no monocytopenia in this case. But if you look at the scatter plot, again, the lymphocytes in this region, they are slightly spread out. They are not like the usual normal small lymphocytes, right? On the peripheral yes. smear, after careful search, we could find a few hairy cells with the typical morphology, which you have already described. And in the bone marrow aspirate also, we found these typical hairy cells with a slight indentation of the nucleus and an occasional plasma cell. Yes, ma'am. Some more smear, uh, some more cells. So finally, at the end of the bone marrow aspirate, we provided a diagnosis similar to what you said. So it yes. was a dilute marrow with few plasma cells and uh, predominantly atypical lymphoid cells with abundant cytoplasm having hairy projections. 
so the DDs you have already given because of the presence of an occasional plasma cell. We also thought we should be ruling out a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma just as a DD. I'm sure there was no other features of the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma there. So, as you said, the further workup will consist of special stains. What was the special stain you would uh, ask for? CD20. Um, special stain. Special stain. Not a trap, ma'am. Trap. Yes, ma yes. Oh, trap. trap and yes. blue cytometry, you have rightly pointed out. And followed by the, we will get the bone marrow biopsy. IHC in this case was not contributory. And we also, as a routine, uh, send all the samples for conventional karyotyping and mutation analysis wherever it is required. This is from not from my lab. Uh, we do not have a trap, but this is how the trap stain will look in hairy cells. Flow cytometry, as you said, we did the flow cytometry to get a bright CD45 inferred cells, which were constituted 78% of the cells, of which only 15% were 19, CD19 positive. And they had the following markers. Now, when, when you talk of a B uh, CLPD, that is chronic lymphoproliferative disorder, you will see that these cells were bright CD20 positive, 79, CD200, and CD38 positive, whereas CD5 and CD23 were negative. So why these markers are important to rule out CLL and the mantle cell. So we are now looking at a uh, B cell uh, lymphoproliferative disorder, which is showing very bright CD20 and a uh, small cluster of it is also showing CD10, but predominantly I would consider it as a CD5, CD10 negative BCLPD. And uh, thus we would proceed with a hairy cell tube, two differentials here, splenic marginal zone lymphoma and the hairy cell whenever you get a CD5 negative, CD10 negative BCLPD, right? Now, your yes. T cells are showing the typical reactive morphology with uh, four, I mean, uh, uh, reactive uh, markers with the equal distribution of four and eight, and they also are positive for CD5 and CD2. Now, coming to your hairy cell tube, as you rightly pointed out, CD103, CD123, CD11C, and CD25 are the four markers we use in our hairy tube. And if you see these co positive cells, cluster of cells, these are your hairy cells, and if you backgate them, they are typically falling in a higher side scatter of the overall CD for uh, 19 positive B cells. Do you appreciate that? Yes, ma'am. So now coming to the uh, uh, immunological score for hairy cell leukemia, please note that a score of three or four is required to call it label it as a hairy cell leukemia of the four markers that is 11c 103 123 and cd25 since in our case we had all the four markers positive we la labeled it as uh, hairy cell leukemia on flow and uh, what is to be uh, noted here is that the other hairy cell like disorders which you mentioned in your dds they have a us uh, lower score that is usually zero or one okay and uh, also note that CD5 negative, 10 negative tumors we consider hairy cell, but some aberrant marker expression of CD10 is also possible in hairy cell leukemia. Now, coming to the biopsy, you have already shown us the biopsy which was hypercellular and these typical cells which are called uh, having a fried egg appearance, right? The, ret um, the reticulin stain showed. Uh, increased fibrosis and this is one of the reasons why these hairy cells do not get pulled out into the periphery and hence you get a dry tap on bone marrow aspirate hence always make sure whether you do a bone marrow or your clinician does it please ask for a biopsy otherwise whenever you have very few circulating tumor cells you will be missing a diagnosis of such cases where there is increased fibrosis so coming to the diagnosis uh, provided by the participants, majority have them uh, labeled it correctly uh, as uh, hairy cell leukemia. But there were two interesting uh, diagnoses that is meta two uh, students who have given it as metastatic RCC, which was a very good finding based on the biopsy. But uh, I uh, guess uh, it uh, they, they have not appreciated the hairy cells which were seen on the aspirate. And I am telling you again that it is important to look at the aspirate very carefully at the morphology of the cells in the aspirate so that you don't miss out on a hairy cell leukemia if the biopsy is not done. Okay. So clinically, the other differential diagnosis, since there was no splenomegaly, 
would be MDS syndromes, the megaloblastic anemia and aplastic anemia. Now WHO fifth edition gives you a beautiful table to differentiate hairy cell leukemia from the hairy cell leukemia like conditions and morphology perspective because we may not always have uh, the luxury of uh, special stains flow or IHC or even molecular will be a morphology. So in uh, uh, SDRPL you will get polar well visible uh, polar projections whereas in uh, splenic mar marginal zone lymphoma you always get some mixture of the plasma cells. In the uh, uh, SBPLN, you get the pro-lymphocytes with prominent nucleolus. This was earlier called as the hairy cell leukemia variant. And uh, hairy cell, you have uh, the projections throughout the circumference. I will not go into the details of this. You can please refer to the WHO 5th edition uh, blue book. But what I would like you to notice is that BRAF mutation is the next step, which is po positive in more than 90% of the cases. So we went ahead and did the BRAF mutation, which detects the mutation on exon 15, which was negative. So again, we went back to literature to see that if exon 15 mutations are not evident, then you would further go ahead to look for other alternative exon 11 mutations. Okay. And why this is important? Because they will use the MEK inhibitors in such cases. And these cases are slightly having a poorer prognosis. Okay. That is the importance of doing the mutation analysis further. Now, this is exactly the essential and the desirable criteria which are given in the fifth edition. So, uh, you have these fine villus projections with the Friday appearance on the biopsy. On IHC, you have a strong CD positivity uh, and annexin I, uh, 1 uh, by IHC, or you can have a co expression of the uh, four hairy cell markers on flow. Desirable criteria the clonal, clonal BRAF mutation. So, typically, we are taught that the hairy, uh, hairy cell leukemia has the triad of splenomegaly, monocytopenia, and hairy cells. However, in this case, we neither had the splenomegaly nor the monocytopenia. Hence, uh, you have to make, uh, I mean, be aware of these cases where splenomegaly may not be present and it may pose a diagnostic dilemma for both clinicians as well as pathologists. But absence of splenomegaly does not exclude the diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. And especially because of the fibrosis, you may have a very small percentage of abnormal mononuclear cells which help you in diagnosing. So bone marrow biopsy, again, is the only morphological important tool for the diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia. There's no staging system here, but treatment will be guided by the degree of cytopenia and disease related symptoms. Uh, uh, purine anal analogs, that is cladribine and pentostatin are used. PRAF inhibitors can be useful. And since CD2022 are very strong, even rituximab has been used in the treatment. Now this patient has uh, shown a good follow-up and uh, she's uh, currently planned for the second round of chemotherapy. Take home messages once again, look for the morphological details on the peripheral blood and bone marrow. There may be a very few cells for you to uh, pick them up. Then atypical presentations one should be aware of. One is absence of splenomegaly. They can also present with enlarged lymph nodes, a high total leukocyte count. Uh, please be aware of the four immunological scoring markers for HCL on flow and also know that Expression of CD10, which usually is negative, may be a aberrant marker in hairy cell leukemia. Early diagnosis helps uh, uh, better treatment and uh, they may also benefit from the newer therapeutic agents if you are uh, doing the molecular studies. So these are my references, uh, very useful references in this case. Anybody knows the why the hairy cells are hairy? So they say that it is because of the overexpression of the cytoskeletal components like actin, uh, intracellular phosphoproteins, and the members of the Rho family. Okay, so this is the reason for the hairy cells. Can we go to the next case? Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, case number ten, Dr. Aishwarya. Dr. Aishwarya. 
Dr. Aishwarya, please introduce yourself. You're not audible. Dr. Aishwarya, you're not audible. No, no, not yet. And now you're ready. He's the audible eye to share my particular book. Let Idil Hakla Hello, Dr. Aishwarya. Uh, Ma'am, there is some problem with the connection. Um, Jayashri, ma'am, shall we take up the next case so, until she solves her problem? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so let's call Dr. Dipali Singh. Are you ready with your case? Yes, ma'am. Okay, please introduce yourself and uh, start sharing your screen. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Yes, yes, I should sure attend. Ma'am, my presentation is visible, I think, now. Okay, we'll start later. Uh, next presentation will be yours. Okay. No issues. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon to all. I am Dr. Dipali Singh, second year pathology PG from Raja Rajeshwari Medical College. I'll be presenting case number 11. The case detail shared was. 65 year old male with large growth in a stomach. Coming to the scanner view, we can see the mucosa lined by gastric epithelium with focal areas of denudation and chronic inflammatory infiltrate. The submucosa and the muscularis layer shows tumor cells arranged in nest and lobules with areas of hemorrhage. The tumor cells are seen invading the mucosa layer as well as to the deep inked margin. Coming to the low power view, you can see the tumor cells are arranged in nest and lobules separated by fibrous septa and multinucleated tumor giant cells are seen. On high power view, we can easily appreciate the morphology of individual cells. The individual cells are round to pleomorphic with abundant cytoplasm with uh, regular to pleomorphic uh, nuclear border with prominent nuclei with brisk mitosis cells forming a pseudo rosin pattern. Section we can see a golden brown pigment. Most likely it can be a hemosiderin pigment or a melanin pigment with the tumor cells. Coming to the next section, we can see areas of hemorrhage and necrosis admixed with the tumor cells. Based on the discussed histomorphological features, my differential diagnosis are lateral neuroendocrine carcinoma, lymphoma, epithelioid gastrointestinal stromal tumors, and melanoma. The features which are seen in large cell endocrine carcinoma are the cells are round, they have abundant cytoplasm, prominent nucleoli, high mitotic activity with areas of necrosis. Whereas in case of lymphoma, the cells are, they, those are the large cells with prominent nucleoli, with abundant cytoplasm, with pseudo rosette formation, and few may show multilocation. Large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma can be confirmed with the help of IHC, that is synaptophysin and chromogranin. For lymphoma, we can use CD45, CD19, CD20, CD3. In case of epithelioid gastrointestinal stromal tumor, the cells are epithelioid in shape. They have a new regular nuclear border 
with the abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm in case of melanoma uh, the cell, they have a vesicular nuclei with a prominent nucleoli and the sub epithelium contains a lymphocytic infiltrate so i would like the radiological findings as well as the ihc report for my final diagnosis thank you yeah good presentation dipali uh, your put Okay, uh, so as you have uh, elucidated the differentials, even the responses which we received also had a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma as a first TD, followed by epithelial gist and lymphoma, melanoma, and uh, uh, one diagnosis of hepatoid adenocarcinoma. Um, actually, uh, we had a partial uh, history. Uh, that is, uh, we received a specimen of uh, gastrectomy along with hardened segment uh, wedge of liver. Uh, the tumor was infiltrating from the liver, like both there was liver tumor. Tumor was both in the wall of the stomach and also the liver. Okay, so there was mucosal ulceration here, and this is a cut surface. You can see the tumor is spanning entire length, both the gastric and the um, liver. So, and actually endoscopy done outside showed ulceration in the stomach and biopsy was done outside called it as polydifferentiated neoplasm. Okay. So, you have described the morphology very nicely. The cells were arranged in nests and there were necrosis. Um, and uh, just with the morphology, can we rule out some of the differentials? Okay. Uh, the neuroendocrine tumor is, that's a first possibility. Uh, the possibility of lymphoma, uh, that is large, large B cell lymphoma or anaplastic lymphoma, which could be considered with this morphology. But one thing is that uh, the lymphomas will not be in this cohesive pattern. Can you see very cohesive? Okay. So, which is the nature of epithelial tumor rather than a lymphoma. Okay. Uh, the cell like nuclear feature, it could be this, the individual cells if we take, yeah, it, we could consider lymphoma, but not as a whole when we consider because of the arrangement, the cohesiveness, which we won't see in the lymphoma cases. And melanoma, there were areas with a prominent like this eosinophilic nucleoli, okay, but not in many cases. And uh, the pigment, yeah, we'll come to, the, uh, come to it later. And one more thing which I want you all to look at uh, is this point. Uh, can you say, Dipali, what are these things? Oh. Hello? Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I'm uh, pointing to? Can you see these things? Where are they and how are they? Okay, within a cell, where is it? Is it, in, is it within the cell or outside the cell? Um, within the cell. Within the cell, where exactly? Mom, it's the nuclear part. Where is it? No, this is a nucleus, but uh, where where are these? See, this is a nucleus. Where is this? And how is that? It's a eosinophilic structure and it has that globular thing. And actually, it's in the cytoplasm. So, there were intracytoplasmic eosinophilic globules. See, uh, uh, does that uh, give clue to anything? Anybody like in chat box, if it gives clue, morphological clue to anything with the, um, okay, we'll go to the next. Okay. So on morphology, yes, it is a polydifferentiated malignant neoplasm with all the DDs which have been, which have been given by Dipali and also from the responders. Uh, we'll go to the IHC. Yeah, Dipali, can you uh, interpret the IHC here? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, CK7 as well as CK20 is negative. Yes. Uh, whereas HEPAR uh, 1 is positive, diffuse positivity uh, by HEPAR 1. Yeah, it's a diffuse cytoplasmic positivity, positivity. and glypic. Yeah. So now uh, the differentials will try to exclude. Uh, if it was a neuroendocrine tumor, what are the uh, markers which will be positive? 
uh, for neuroendocrine tumor, ma'am, synaptophysin and chromogranin would come positive. Positive. So ma now here, this is a negative marker. And also CK7 would have been positive. And what pattern there will be? That paranuclear dot pattern of staining will be there. Okay. And uh, epithelial gist, CD117 and DOG1 is negative. And CK19 is negative. I'll be telling to telling you later why, CK, what is the importance of CK19. And uh, as it was shown in morphology, the key 67 is also very high here. So very with high. this, uh, can you can you um, tell can you come to any diagnosis with this markers? Mom, it's not a gist or a neuroendocrine origin, but yes. with a high mitotic activity, that is definitely a high proliferating tumor. Yes. yes. So what what diagnosis will you think of? Which uh, which tumor will have hepar and glypican one positivity? You leave the stomach. Otherwise, what's a marker? Like hepar is for what? It's the for hepatocellular differentiation. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the final diagnosis is carcinoma exhibiting hepatoid differentiation. Now. Uh, the clinically everything it was looking like a primary stomach malignancy which was infiltrating the liver now but we have a with IHC thing we have a, a differentials of like is it primary hepatocellular carcinoma which is infiltrating from the liver to the stomach or is it a primary gastric hepatoid adenocarcinoma which is coming from the stomach to the liver which is infiltrating the liver so how do we go about it so we have to correlate all the three things that's radiology uh, and CT, CT, if you see HCC, it has a very characteristic contrast CT that is enhancing an arterial phase. And um, okay, so that's very characteristic. And clinical history also, whether the lesion is only if it is only in the stomach or is it only in the liver, and if it is CA stomach metastasizing to the liver. So all the history is very important. And finally, to the finally, our histopathology with IHC markers, which will help in definitive diagnosis. So, how to differentiate HCC uh, versus hepatoid adeno, uh, adenoid carcinoma or uh, common gastric adenocarcinomas? So, AFP in hepatoid adenocarcinoma, it will be positive in 92% of cases. And uh, in HCC, it can be positive, but more poorly differentiated or only in few percentage of cases. And glypican, 100% of cases uh, are positive in hepatoid adenocarcinoma. And one marker which they say will be very helpful is CK19, which is seen in 100% of cases of hepatoid adenocarcinoma. That's why we had done CK19, which is negative. Okay, CK7 and 20, both, uh, it will be negative in both HCC and, and hepatoid adenocarcinoma. And in gastric, CK7, CK20 will be positive, 7 plus or minus. And one more marker which helps in diagnosis is, uh, is SAL4. Uh, sorry, this should come here. SAL4 will be positive in hepatoid adenocarcinoma. We know commonly SAL4 is used for germ cell tumors, but actually SAL4 is a marker of uh, fetal development. So in gastrointestinal fetal development, tract tra tra development, it will be positive. So usually SAL4 will be positive in hepatoid adenocarcinomas and some cases of gas conventional gastric adenocarcinoma. So for, we wanted to know additional information uh, where, because IHC favored more more of hepatocellular carcinoma than hepatoid, hepatoid adenocarcinoma, but serum uh, AFP levels was normal. But if it was elevated also, it could be elevated both in hepatoid adenocarcinoma and also in HCC. Uh, there were no history suggestive of uh, hepatitis B like or cirrhosis. Uh, so it was like uh, on final thing, it was considered as gas gastric hepatoid adenocarcinoma, which was infiltrating the liver. So where does this uh, hepatoid adenocarcinoma come in WHO classification? It's a malignant epithelial tumor under adenocarcinoma. It's a rare variant, rare subtype of adenocarcinoma. Okay, so it's a unique type of extracellular adenocarcinoma uh, with a significant component showing hepatocellular differentiation. And IHC, I've already uh, told you, and CK19 will be positive in 100% of cases. And it is very important to see the complete uh, correlation okay the location the origin that is very important to make a final diagnosis
Okay, so other tumors which can produce AFP in stomach or well differentiated papillary or tubular type adenocarcinomas and adenocarcinoma of enteroblastic differentiation or yolk sac tumor like carcinomas. So, uh, one more import before I end this case, it's uh, like all the PG should know various classification of gastric cancers. I hold based on morphology, gross, and microscopic. Okay, so this is the NWHO. Please. Uh, uh, make a now uh, make use of this opportunity to just revise this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Preeti Sarkar. Dr. Aishwarya, your case will be taken next. Dr. Preeti Sarkar. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Yeah, please introduce yourself and share your screen. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Preeti Sarkar from Tempegoda Institute of uh, Medical Science, Bangalore. I am presenting case number 12. May I share my PPT, ma'am? Yeah. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, yes. So, case number 12. The history given was 33-year-old male with growth in the upper alveolus. And the whole mound view was like this. So it is showing four uh, tissue fragments in between which the two tissue fragments are showing the neoplastic cells. And the larger bit is pretty well circumscribed, showing the some areas of nodularity. And if we observe closely, these nodules are containing tumor cells. And there are also many cystic spaces that are filled with tumor cells in various patterns. So the most patterns we are observing here are cystic papillary patterns. Then also some are seen in tubular patterns, cribriform patterns, then anastomosin uh, trabecular uh, pattern are also seen. And uh, if we go in high power, we can see these cystic spaces are lined by low columnar to cuboidal epithelium at places they are flattening. And uh, if we uh, observe that uh, lining epithelium, the nucleus are haphazardly arranged. And at places, they are away from the basement membrane. And also the tumor cells, in between the tumor cells, we can, uh, some areas are showing secretions. So if into the individual cells, that individual cells have abundant cytoplasm with indistinct cell borders. And the nuclei are mildly pleomorphic which are round to oval and they are vesicular. And also many of the nuclei are showing the optical clearing and some are showing grooving also. Here in the arrow pointing, we, are, we can see that grooving and the optically clear nuclei we are seeing. Coming to the stroma, the stroma is a vascularized fibrous stroma and uh, it appears to be hyalinized at places. And if we observe here, we can see something is entrapped here. If we go in higher magnification, we can see some bony spicules are entrapped within the stroma. And also the other bit is showing the similar type of tumor arrangement. And uh, there is an area of sclerosing or swelling pattern also we have seen. So based on the morphological patterns, my uh, differential diagnosis will be polymorphous adenocarcinoma, my point favoring is that uh, it uh, usually arises from the minor salivary glands. So uh, the region here, it was upper alveolus and uh, though it was written upper alveolus, it could be uh, like nearer to the retromolar trigon also. So if it uh, comes in that area, so uh, it is a possibility. And the uh, lesion we can see here, it is well circumscribed, it is not capsulated. And we are seeing here the cytological uniformity, but the histological diversity, we are seeing different patterns. And uh, most importantly, the striking feature is the pale optically clear to vesicular nuclei, which uh, remembering of the papillary thyroid carcinoma. So the other possibilities uh, based on the location and the history we can consider are based on the morphological pattern, it could be cribriform adenocarcinoma, which is also a variant of nowadays uh, that polymorphous adenocarcinoma. And also the some areas that cystic papillary pattern that is looking like vascular neoplasm, uh, like glomeruloid pattern. So we can consider vascular neoplasm we, that we can also discuss. 
and based on the location as it was written upper uh, alveolus so the origin of odontogenic tumor can be considered if we consider that that adenomatoid odontogenic tumor can be a consideration thank you uh, thank you Preeti. it was a nice presentation you described all the findings uh, The responses were also like uh, the different the first, many of them had diagnosed as polymorphous adenocarcinoma and in fact three of them had called cribriform variant and uh, again amyloblastoma five people and vascular tumor uh, so almost your differentials and the uh, responses also match so this is thing like it, it predominantly had that cribriform pattern and probably vascular why many people are considering there is this dilated spaces which are filled by this uh, neoplastic cells but closer view, they have moderate amount of cytoplasm. Okay, they are all looking very low grade, not much of pleomorphism, not much of mitosis. Uh, if it was vascular, one more important like point is they will not have this much of cytoplasm and some like uh, the nuclei will be much bigger and a hobnailing. So I, I just come to put this picture to compare. Uh, if it was vascular tumor, uh, it would have not had this much of cytoplasm. Okay, so these are the uh, differentials for these case, that's polymorphous adenocarcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma, or cellular pleomorphic adenoma. And if amyloblastoma, it has the characteristic thing that is central stellate reticulum with the peripheral epithelial cells, which was not seen in this case. Okay, it was all one type of cells. Uh, so the final diagnosis in this was polymorphous adenocarcinoma, cribriform subtype. Okay, so there are like why, there are two types that is conventional and cribriform. Uh, so, what is uh, special about this cribriform adenocarcinoma is that it has a propensity for base of tongue, so more common there, and uh, high risk of lymph nodal metastasis and higher chances of association with this PRKD gene rearrangement. And it's the second most common intraoral salivary gland carcinoma. Uh, Preeti, can, do you know which is a, can you say which is the first most common malignant salivary gland tumor of oral cavity? or anybody like uh, you can write in the chat box um so that uh, that's a thing uh so why is it one more thing i want to ask Preeti, why is it called polymorphous because of the uh, different histomorphological patterns that is uh, not a single pattern so variation yeah. of the pattern yes good good which other tumor uh, has like this because of the patterns, the name comes, not because of the pleomorphism of the cells. Which other salivary gland tumor? Common salivary gland tumor, benign? Oh, pleomorphic. Pleomorphic. Pleomorphic, uh, pleomorphic yes. adenoma because pleomorphic. it has various components. Okay. So, yes. yeah, it has only single type. And now uh, it's not called in a new thing, it's not called a low grade polymorphous low grade because why we can we get both high grade thing so that's what cribriform adenocarcinomas you know now it is a type of polymorphous adenocarcinoma so just uh, one or two um, slides on approach to salivary gland means you have to see what cell types is it bezeloid or is it uh, plasma cytoid or does the tumor has two dual population so where does this polymorphous come it is a single it contains single cells and or it has that Bezeloid look. So IHC, uh, it's uh, it's P40 negative, but P63 positive, and other adenoid cystic carcinomas will be positive for both P63 and P40. And one more marker which will be diffusely positive in this case is acetate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now for uh, salivary gland tumor, you know, there's so much molecular, uh, specific molecular alteration. And even IHCs have come up for each of these alterations and which might uh, in future uh, means help in therapy, targeted therapy. So um, I really want to share this slide. Of, I, I couldn't replace this slide with any other thing, which is by Dr. Rajendran. Uh, so this is very brief. Uh, in a single slide, there are so many things, so much of message which has been put up. So you can take a screenshot of this and keep it. So the expression of IHC markers in salivary gland tumor, the SOX10, which is expressed uh, before salivary, uh, like intercollected duct. So when you have the differentials of various uh, tumors on either side, you can use the SOX10. So, so this is a take, you know, take home message from me. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
Ma'am, now. Hello, ma'am. It's not visible. I've shared it. Just okay. Uh, to save time, can you just read out? It's okay. Let's go ahead with your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the history given was: he's a seventy-one-year-old male. Uh, with yes. history of uh, diabetes and BPH and incidentally detected pancytopenia. Clinically, there was no organomegaly. And uh, the complete blood count parameters were HP of 7.6, uh, total count of 1,570, platelet count of uh, 30,000. And uh, the DC was neutrophils were 52%, lymphocytes 45, monocytes 1.3, and the US, no, uh, US were 1.3, and the basic is 0. Uh, the bone marrow aspiration uh, slide that was given, for his age was a hypercellular bone marrow. Uh, it was an adequate one. The myeloid to erythroid ratio was reduced. There was erythroid hypoplasia. Uh, and erythropoiesis, the, uh, it was increased. And uh, erith uh, few of them showed cytoplasmic budding and uh, megalobl megaloblastoid. Uh, OK. OK, go ahead. I'm just a second. Uh, myelopoiesis was also increased and showed myeloblast, promyelocytes, myelocyte mm -hmm. with occasional band forms and hypolobated neutrophils. The megakaryocytes were normal and the lymphocytes were reduced. Plasma cells were normal. There were no parasites seen. Uh, and this is a bone marrow aspiration slide showing uh, uh, majority of the erythroids and they show cytoplasmic uh, buddings. And uh, there is a megaloblastoid uh, change in the Erythroid, that is, uh, there is nucleus is to cytoplasmic uh, maturation asynchrony was seen. And then a blast with high NC ratio and prominent nucleo, uh, nucleoli was seen. Megakaryocytes were seen. And uh, bone marrow trifan biopsy was adequate and normal, bro uh, there were normal bony, bony trabecula enclosing markedly hypercellular marrow spaces. Megakaryocytes are normal. Marrow spaces enclosing erythroids and myeloids were seen. Uh, my DDs were. Myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, acute myeloid uh, leukemia M6 and M7. Myelodysplastic syndrome because uh, there were uh, there was uh, dysplasia in more than uh, uh, one lineage, uh, and uh, M6 it was uh, it could be an erythroid leukemia, and M7 because of the cytoplasmic budding that is seen that that is a characteristic feature of M7 where uh, megakaryos uh, blastic uh, cells will show that. Uh, platelet budding. Flow cytometry and uh, cytochemistry would be helpful in uh, coming to a diagnosis. Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. No problem. How will flow help you in MDS? MDS, ma'am, uh, very uh, side uh, scattering will be, uh, low side scatter will be seen in uh, MDS. Okay. Uh, and uh, to before we come to MDS, we have to rule out megaloblastic anemia. There are very uh, other causes like uh, viral, uh, certain drugs also can cause uh, MDS. So, Excellent. Very good. Very good presentation. You have covered all the points. Uh, what I will do is I will take you through the presentation and then we will discuss if any points were missed out. So as you have highlighted, the history was fine. Uh, what I want to note, uh, you to notice is this is from a normal CBC. Again, I 
uh, urge everybody to look at the scattergrams. Whenever you look at the CBC, please do not go only by the numerical uh, uh, numericals. So if you see, look at the myeloid cells, they are high on the side scatter this side. But in, in, in cases of MDS, since majority of have, uh, you have given the diagnosis of MDS, let me show you how they get shifted towards the left. So these immature cells, slightly immature cells, and because of the dysplasia, they get shifted to the uh, left. On the peripheral smear, you had macro ovulocytes and the teardrop cells. And you could notice the uh, uh, dysplasia in the neutrophilic series even in the peripheral smear. So you see that there is hypolobation, hypolobated nu uh, neutrophils. There are abnormal nuclear uh, uh, neutrophils with ring neutrophils, hypolobated once again. This is on the aspirate, as Aishwarya has told us already about all the findings, the binucleate uh, forms, there are megaloblasts, there are cytoplasmic vacuolations and cytoplasmic blebbing. There are Howell jolly bodies in within the uh, normoblast. And if you notice the myeloid cells, I don't know if you really notice that hypogranularity in the myeloid cells. Apart from that, the nuclear abnormalities in the myeloid cells was quite evident. And in the background, you are seeing myeloblasts. So uh, this is where you have to really differentiate on morphology, whether they look like myeloblasts or the M7 blasts. Again, cytoplasmic blebbing and nuclear abnormalities. Now, coming to the bone marrow, uh, did you see that you didn't find them dysplastic, the megakaryocytes? Uh, there were I... quite a few dysplastic megakaryocytes, abnormal nuclear lobation, and separated nuclei, nuclei and hypolobated forms. Okay. What is another stain you need to do in cases of MDS? For ring to look for uh, ring cerebroblast. What stain is this? What stain is this? Uh, Persian. Pearls, Persian blue. Pearls, Persian. Yeah, and how do you define ring cerebroblast? Uh, the granules will be present in the uh, more than 10 granules. Uh, I didn't know. Okay. There are more than five granules encircling more than one third of the nucleus. And whenever these ring cerebroblasts are seen, you look for SF3B1 mutations. Okay. So on the bone marrow aspirate with the DC, we got 15% blast and there was trilineage dysplasia. So possibility of MDS with increased blast has to be considered. And as you rightly pointed out, we have to rule out the other causes which can cause dysplasia in the hematopoietic cells. We'll come to that later. Bone marrow biopsy, you have already described. It was quite hypercellular. And you can see that there is hardly any maturation seen here. So now at this point, you have a problem with whether they are, uh, you saw both uh, megaloblasts as well as myeloblasts on the aspirate, right? So yes. on the biopsy, how do you differentiate? What is the clue whether it is a myeloblast or a megaloblast? Uh, Ma'am, usually they'll be uh, around that uh, trabeculin or um, uh, Which cells are around the trabeculin? All that myeloid uh, lineage cells. Yes, uh, with... correct. So the myeloid cells are paratrabecular. What happens in MDS? There, uh, there'll be a typical localization of immature. Uh, Very good. Because... Yeah. And they get located in the uh, center in the okay. interstitium. They are not okay. paratrabecular anymore. Also, if you look at the morphology, these megaloblasts have linear nucleoli. Okay. Whereas myeloblasts have multiple nucleoli, which are not towards the periphery. These nucleoli are linear and they are attached to the nuclear margin in megaloblasts. You can see a hyperchromatic bizarre megakaryocyte. Okay. Yes. And you, what you see here is? A megakaryocyte. Megakaryocyte, which is? Close to the... Okay. And morphology-wise, how is the nucleus? Uh... Hypolobate, uh, like it's a micro. Yeah, it's mega small. It's a dwarf megakaryocyte, and you see yes. a single lobation. But beware on trifine biopsy, do not label them as hypolobated because you don't know. They are big cells. Na? So, in one section, you may just get one lobe. You might 
feel that they are hypolobated okay. do not comment on that on the trephine biopsy right and uh, even paratrabecular loca localization of the megakaryocytes is a feature of mds which you can see here this is a trabeculus and a bizarre megakaryocyte there the reticulin stain uh, uh, showed mf1 and uh, this was a hypercellular marrow again showing dysplasia we suggested ihc because our uh, aspirate was uh, slightly hemodiluted so we wanted to know the blast percentage we do not do uh, flow for mds in our center not required with cytogenetics uh, it is enough and you can use ihc and the morphology to define your blast this is a stain uh, uh, mylopero uh, myeloperoxidase which stains the myeloid cells cd34 is done to enumerate the oh. what is the stain used for cd34 the myeloid blast myeloid Myeloid blast. Myeloid blast. And what is the internal control for CD34? You see this? It's a vessel lining, endothelial yes. cell, right? So that is here. So overall, if you look at it, it looks corresponding to our bone marrow aspirate. Even here, the blast percentage was around 15%. And this is just to show you the megaloblast. The rest of the cells were your megaloblast. Okay. Conventional karyotyping was done, which showed deletions in 7, deletion 7Q, 11Q, and deletion 20Q. 20. 20. Okay. Now, with this, if you look at the IPSS uh, 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 risk groups, so it already, there are three abnormalities. So it is a poor prognostic indicator. Along with that, you have more than 10% blast. Then your uh, platelets are low, your hemoglobin low, is low, and ANC is also low. This is how the risk stratification is done. Okay. So mutation analysis is also recommended to rule out any other AML-related mutations. In our case, it was negative. This is your new WHO classification. They prefer to call it myelodysplastic neoplasm instead of myelodysplastic syndrome. However, MDS itself will be retained. It will not become MDN. Okay. And uh, this is the new classification with uh, uh, MDS with uh, genetic abnormalities, morphologically defined, and myelodysplastic neoplasms of the childhood. The essential and desirable criteria are here cytopenias involving one or more lineages, and uh, dysplasia should be more at least in 10% of the cells. Blast more than 5% in the bone marrow and or more than 2% in the peripheral blood. And no other fulfilling criteria for MDS with biallelic TP53 inactivation or AML. Now, when you call cytopenia, these are your cutoffs for hemoglobin, absolute neutrophil count and platelets. For dysplasia, the cutoff is 10% and for blast, it is 20%. Now, in my MDS with increased blast, again, it is subdivided into MDS 1, 2 and MDS with fibrosis. What you also need to know that uh, though we say that 20% is the cutoff to call it AML, there are now the uh, acute myeloid leukemias with uh, defining genetic abnormalities wherein you don't need the 20% cutoff. All right. Except for BCR, ABL and SEPA mutation. All other acute myeloid leukemias with the rest of the genetic abnormalities can be uh, released as AMS, even though the blast count is not 20%. The diagnosis sub uh, submitted in this case was varied, but uh, majority of them have called it uh, MDS. I mean, nine of them equally distributed. Many have called it acute leukemia. Probably it is very difficult to do a DC on the uh, images uh, because we do not have the oil immersion uh, uh, facility here. Uh, some of them, nine of them have called it hemophagocytosis, HLH. Probably they have seen one uh, histiocyte with engulfed uh, uh, debris and then started looking for more and more and in the process they have missed out on all the blasts and other dysplastic features. So don't miss the forest for the trees. Okay, a uh, few of them have uh, called it metastasis and infiltrative uh, bone marrow lesion. But of course, you have to look at the morphology. Where is the clustering or the SNR pattern? Some pattern you will observe. Here it was totally in sheets. 
even if you would call it a lipo proliferative it is still okay but uh, on aspirate the morphology is very clear you should learn to differentiate the blast from the chronic lymphoproliferative disorders okay so morphology practice a lot of morphology with bone marrow aspirates this patient is now uh, doing very well already on third cycle of azatidine and the bone marrow has uh, was in morphological remission uh, the take home message as uh, aishwarya has already said that in a as a general precaution you should not label any case as mds without knowing the clinical or drug history and uh, no case of mds should be reclassified as aml if they are on growth factors even on erythropoietin you should be very cautious you have to rule out the secondary causes like drugs infections metabolic deficiencies and immune disorders copper deficiency and arsenic toxicity can also very closely resemble mds and when there is a hypercellular marrow like how we saw in our case uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm also will be near you will need to rule out so thank you very much good aishwarya in spite of your you. uh, uh, slight uh, glitches in your transmission you presented very well thank you thank you ma'am that was very engaging and informative presentation great mix of visual and uh, content uh that complete the trial different cases and approach in solving them now uh, dear team i would like to ask you to please choose the best case presentation among the contestants you want us to do it nitya <laughs> yes yeah. okay i think we have chosen sclerosing pneumocytoma only one prize right yes yes ma'am i think it will be can you have two <laughs> <laughs> i'm for saying it has not happened till now ma'am uh, can we have a tie oh uh, sure ma'am <laughs> okay so one will be sclerosing pneumocytoma my case from yeni poya Doctor Kirti, I think. Doctor Kirti. Yes, from Yeni Poya. And Doctor Smita. Doctor Smita from Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know which college she's from. Medical College, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. You're welcome. <laughs> you did Thank a good so job. Much. Congratulations, <laughs> Doctor Kirti and Doctor Smita. Oh. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. Uh, anything you would like to say to them? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd like to thank all the students for their enthusiastic and uh, very uh, active participation. You all had researched your, you know, your cases well. You came up with DDs. Obviously, you'd gone to a lot of trouble, and you know, you can always go back to the digital images. Thanks to Morphe, you can go and look at them again now that you know the diagnosis accurately. Yes. and uh, we wish you all the best as you go through your studies and complete your courses successfully again thank you aditya and kc iipm we look forward to further academic um, engagements with you and uh, you have kept under the banner of kc iipm it's, you've kept it flying high so wish you all the best and thank you everyone have a good weekend thank you so thank much thank you ma'am. thank you on behalf of our entire team and attendees i would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our esteemed speakers uh, thank you for sharing your uh, valuable insights with us today ma'am your perspectives have been truly enlightening and uh, have an indelible impression on us we are grateful for the time and effort you have uh, invested in preparing for this webinar and for your engaging delivery the passion and dedication to pathology have truly inspired us all we are grateful for the opportunity to learn from you and look forward to apply the same uh, in, to our own work we hope to have the privilege of hearing from you again in the future thank Absolutely. you once again for joining us thank you and for your thank you good evening thank you. good evening yeah. aditya sir